did she kill her boyfriend or was she framed? Quite the mystery in this case. You know, I've heard about this case a couple months back and Karen Reed is on trial today. It is opening statements. The state says that she got an argument with her boyfriend and she dropped him off at friend's house. And not only did she drop him off at a friend's house, but she allegedly hit him with the car and then drove off. And that's what caused him to die out there in the snow. Apparently the next day, you know, she went home, she slept and she's like, oh, geez, my boyfriend isn't here. I wonder where he is. So apparently she goes back to the house and her and I think her two friends found her boyfriend in the snow, dead body out there. However, her defense story is quite an interesting one. And this is why I was initially interested in this case. because I was like, this shit is like, it's wild. It's crazy. Her defense is that, well, I dropped off my boyfriend at the friend's house. Something must have went down because my boyfriend was found with, I think they said that he had like bite marks or something, like scratch marks on him. Looks like maybe a dog attacked him and maybe some sort of like blunt force trauma. So she's accusing of the people in that house of murdering her boyfriend. Maybe the dog too. I don't know. Quite a crazy thing that's going on right now. Um, We're going to listen to opening statements and I hope you guys are doing well. Hello, hello. Also, we have some new developments in the Suzanne Morphew case. That's a case that not a lot of people are really talking about, but I did do a true crime story time about that case. Definitely check that video out because her murder is still an unsolved murder. Um, she was murdered over a couple years ago, and I think she's recently celebrating her, should be her birthday right about now, but, um, oh, also her birthday, and then also, I think, um, the anniversary of her, of her death, so her body was found, um, a couple months back, and they finally released the autopsy report, and you know what, the autopsy report kind of, it kind of aligns with the state's theory, however, that case is so screwed up unfortunately because the state prosecutor that was involved and some other i don't know like the judges were involved it's like a whole mess with like a bunch of people that you're just like oh my god this is such a freaking headache i don't know get all cozy up and now let's let's, let's watch the karen reed trial let's go right and that's what we ask of you so with that it's time for opening statements and whenever you're ready miss delally thank you <clears throat> oh let me get my notes up too and I ask only that you keep your voice up, please. I'll do my best. Good morning. Uh, so as Ron was telling you, uh, this is one of the two opportunities that I will get. Yo, what happened to his microphone? Why, why is the judge's microphone so loud? Okay, I'm going to boost this man up a little bit because his microphone is not as great as the judge. To, uh, to address you. Um, the... First of which, right now, uh, essentially, uh, what I'm going to attempt to do, and I know you heard over the course of the impoundment process, a number of different witnesses that were listed out as, as far as potential witnesses in this case. Wait, why is he so low now? What the fudge? Okay, I'm going to boost the audio. Let me know if I should make it louder. Uh, so what my intent here is to provide as much of a roadmap as I can through uh, those waters and help you to navigate sort of who these people are. <coughs> and what relation they have to this case. We start with John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe uh, grew up in Braintree. He was 46 years old when he passed. He was the son of... Uh, oh, this is the victim's mother? Oh. It must be so tough to, like, have to go there and then, like, your child's dead. Um, also, this story gets even more wild because John O'Keefe is or uh, was a police officer. And the people in that house, I think there were like either coworkers or they have family that's also in law enforcement. So this is the whole accusation of like, just not a, like a family cover up, but also like a law enforcement cover up. So Karen Reed's, uh, her defense, uh, they are, there are a lot of accusations out there and some very uh, hefty, serious ones. Watch her face during prosecutors. Mm. I could, I could just tell like, she's just going to be really upset the entire time. Hi, Daniela. Uh, John O'Keefe Jr. and Margaret or Peggy O'Keefe. He was a brother to Paul O'Keefe uh, and to his sister, Kristen Furbush. Kristen uh, was married, and so John's brother-in-law uh, was a man named Stephen And they had two children uh, who were very young uh, in 2013. Now, in 2013, uh, Kristen, uh, unfortunately, tragically, uh, passed away, succumbing to, uh, to cancer uh, in November of 2013. Within months of that, uh, Mr. O'Keefe's brother-in-law and Kristen's husband, Stephen, uh, passed away as well. Now, initially, 
uh, when John O'Keefe's sister passed away, uh, sort of the initial plan uh, for that situation was that uh, John O'Keefe was going to move in with Stephen Forbush and the kids. And they had Karen Reed merch in the courtroom. Dude, I heard about her supporters. She's got some strong supporters out there. And apparently one of them uh, was arrested and charged with like witness intimidation or something like that uh, a couple months back. I think this is like back in like was it like December or something. And assist uh, as far as raising it. And then uh, when Stephen passed away a few months after his wife, uh, before those plans could be final, um, John O'Keefe then moved in uh, with his niece and nephew and assumed the parental role and assumed legal guardianship uh, with respect to both of those children. Now, he was assisted in this uh, by a great number of people within the town of Canton where the four bushes uh, lived. Uh, and where John moved into uh, the home with the two children there. There were other parents uh, within the neighborhood, other parents within the children's age group. Uh, you'll hear from a number of them over the course of this trial, uh, but they included Mrs. Kerry Roberts and Mrs. Uh, Jennifer McKay. Uh, they helped Mr. O'Keefe out during those initial stages and, and during the time uh, that he uh, assumed this role. <coughs> he also got help from his work. John O'Keefe was a uh, proud member of the Boston Police Department, had been for many years. Uh, he had been a patrolman prior to uh, moving in with the children and assuming uh, this little role. Uh, Boston Police Department helped him greatly as far as positioning him to more of a desk role. Uh, oh, I think it's the judge that needs to turn off her microphone or something. I, I don't know if it's the judge because her microphone was really loud. I think she might be bringing the, the microphone or someone is bringing the microphone right now. Working in the <clears throat> sex offender unit uh, with more regular hours to sort of assimilate himself to this new life uh, and this new role that he has uh, with these children. Initially, John O'Keefe lived in the house uh, with the kids. Uh, however, in 2018, uh, they moved into a new home, sort of a new home that they could have as their own. Uh, that home is located also within the town of Canton, sort of on the Stoughton side of Canton at uh, One Meadows Avenue. John O'Keefe raised these children, uh, assuming guardianship uh, for them for about eight years. Uh, his niece, who was the elder of the two, was about 14 at the time uh, that John O'Keefe died, and his uh, nephew uh, was about 11 years old at the time uh, that John O'Keefe died. January 28, 2022, uh, was a relatively typical day. It was Friday going into a Saturday of January 29th. Um, sort of typical in the sense uh, of most sort of suburban parents. There were a lot of activities, weekend sports, practices, games, things of that nature uh, that the O'Keefe and Furbush uh, family had to look forward to. One little difference uh, when it came to that particular day of January 28th and the 29th is the weather. So there had been predicted and there was going to be a snowstorm and insignificant one. Uh, a blizzard essentially was coming in overnight that Friday and Saturday, uh, lasting through most of the day on Saturday the 29th. And as a result of that, most of those sort of typical, you know, weekend routine activities that <clears throat> would keep most people in the booting those within the town can busy have been canceled ahead of time. Everybody knew what was coming. Everybody knew essentially you weren't going to leave your house all that much. This is actually a very interesting courtroom light. I've never seen it like this before. Um, so it seems like is everyone facing this way? But then for some reason, the defense and their attorneys are facing that way like i don't know <laughs> this is such an interesting layout that i'm looking at right here um also this uh, snowstorm thing is pretty important because they are saying that well karen's defense team they're saying that something happened in the house you know either they beat him up they murdered him or something and then they just threw his dead body outside in the street in the snow and they also said that the people that were in the house apparently Googled how long does it take for body or it was something about like how long does it take to, to die in the snow or in the cold or something like that. But I think the state said that that search actually happened after the body was found. I don't know. Now also on January 28th, Mr. O'Keefe had received some news in respect to his niece. So his niece and her best friend uh, were in eighth grade at the time going to high school in the fall of 2022. They had both applied to a private school called Bishop Union, and they both found out on the 28th that they had been accepted to that school. Uh, so the friend, as well as her father, a gentleman by the name of Michael Camerano, uh, who's uh, both he and his wife, Catherine Camerano, were friendly uh, with John O'Keefe. Uh, they had children around the same ages <clears throat> as both John's niece and his nephew. And they had come over to their house on Meadows Ave that evening to celebrate girls getting into that school. Um, the nephew of John, uh, the 11 year old, uh, was sleeping over a friend's house that night. He left that home sometime around 7 p.m. or so, got picked up, and, and went to sleep over his friend's house. John O'Keefe and Michael Camarano then uh, decided to travel out to a local establishment on Washington Street called C.F. McCarthy, bar and restaurant. Uh, you're going to hear testimony, uh, and you're going to see surveillance video, and you're going to see receipts and all kinds of things from 
variety of different establishments, all sort of located within Camden Center along that strip in Washington Street. Like now, <clears throat> they get uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Camerano, uh, leave the girls at home. Uh, they then go to see if McCarthy is arriving there sometime between 7.30 and 8 p.m. They <clears throat> eventually uh, cajole another friend of theirs, Mr. Kurt Roberts, uh, to come out to the bar uh, and join them as well. And there's some other people. Cajole is like when you're uh, like convincing someone, right? That are located within the bar, including Mr. James Sullivan, who we hear from, who was uh, present at the bar that night as well. Eventually, the defendant, Karen Reed, joins them at this establishment in C.F. McCarthy's uh, sometime just before 9 p.m. Now, John O'Keefe and Karen Reed had met sometime in 2004. They had dated uh, briefly during that time and, and reconnected sometime around March of 2020, around the time of the COVID-19 uh, sort of pandemic shutdown. <clears throat> they had started dating around that time period or reconnected during that time period. And uh, the defendant had stayed at the house in Canton several nights a week. She had helped out uh, with the children. In the month or so leading up to Mr. O'Keefe's death, hey, Catherine. the relationship south. You will see text messages uh, between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed uh, to that effect. You will uh, hear testimony uh, from the children, uh, from John's niece and nephew, in regard to uh, things they observed within that relationship. I think Karen Reed was trying to uh, accuse her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, the victim, of like, like infidelity or something. And you'll hear testimony from, from other individuals as far as their observations or things that they have uh, heard. Turning to January 29th. They fixed their microphone. Yay! They got rid of, like, the background noise. Okay, someone just needed to mute their microphone back there. That's what it was, I'm pretty sure. 2022. Just after 6 a.m., the Canton Police Department receives a 911 call from a woman reporting a male party subsequently identified as John O'Keefe, found in the snow outside residence at the 34 Fairview Road. At the time, as I mentioned, blizzards that have been predicted was occurring. Heavy snow, temperatures in the teens, uh, wind uh, bustling around. Officer Stephen Sarif and Officer Stephen Mullaney of the Cam Police were dispatched along with Cam Fire and EMS, and you'll hear uh, from them in regard to uh, their response and what they observed uh, on scene. In particular, with Officer Sarif, you'll uh, have as an exhibit that anticipates a uh, cruiser camera uh, video from his cruiser detailing or memorializing sort of his response uh, in the darkness, in the blizzard type conditions uh, as he's driving from the Cam Police Station, where he was located when he received the call. Uh, 234 Fairview Wood. When they arrive there, <clears throat> they observe uh, three individuals, three females, uh, sort of off to the left side of the property. And when I say the left side of the property, I mean if you're standing out in the street facing 34 Fairview Road, off to the left side of the property, there's a flagpole, there's a fire hydrant, uh, there's some bushes. Uh, that is where this road keeps is located. On the right side of the property is, is sort of the driveway and the mailbox and uh, other things that you'll become familiar with uh, through photographic evidence and other means through the course of this trial. Okay, must be important. Three females uh, that the officers observed there uh, were then identified as the defendant, Karen Reed, uh, Mrs. Jennifer McCabe, who had received a phone call earlier in the morning uh, from the defendant, as well as Mrs. Kerry Roberts, who had also received a phone call early that morning from the defendant. The several firefighters uh, from the Kent Fire Department you'll hear from in regard to their observations of uh, injuries, uh, abrasions, and lacerations to the right arm of Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, you hear their testimony in regard to swelling uh, of his eyes. And other injuries that he observed, they observed uh, redness <clears throat> from the cold that he observed. Oh, you know what? Do you guys know what car Karen Reed was driving? Was she driving in a, an SUV? Something that like sits a little bit higher? Hey, Richie, Sal, Christine, how are you doing today? Catherine, what's up? What's going on? I'm lying out in uh, for some time. You'll hear the testimony from uh, these firefighters, Timothy <clears throat> Nuttall, Anthony Fumati, uh, Matthew Kelly, Francis Walsh, uh, Katie McLaughlin, and Greg Woodbury. And at least from three of those uh, firefighters, you'll hear testimony. Mm, it was a black SUV, okay. Anticipates uh, detailing statements that the defendant made to me when they had asked about the origination of some of those injuries. Because initially I was like, hmm, I don't know how she would hit it in a way where I think they said like he might have an injury to his head, but SUV would totally make sense then. <laughs> and stated repeatedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. 
Oh, she said they that? Too, when they had asked about the origination of some of those injuries. And stated repeatedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Mr. O'Keefe uh, was then taken from the front lawn uh, onto what they call a scoop stretcher. As he's doing that, I anticipate you'll hear Ms. Roberts' testimony. That so she tells people that responded there, like law enforcement, I guess, I hit him, I hit him. I wonder if that's on body cam footage. Also, I wonder if she's now retrospectively changing her story and saying like, oh, when I said I hit him, I didn't mean I hit him with my car. I just meant like I physically hit him with my hand. I don't know. Like the six inches of snow approximately that was on top of Mr. O'Keefe's body and the snow throughout the, the roadway, front yard, everywhere around where he was. There was grass underneath Mr. O'Keefe uh, where his cell phone was located underneath his body as he lay on that front lawn. Oh. He was then transported uh, by um, firefighters Kelly, Flamati, and Nuttall. Uh, as well as uh, the ambulance being driven by firefighter McLaughlin uh, to the Good Samaritan Medical Center. Once there, there are some observations, and you'll hear <clears throat> testimony from Dr. Justin Rice uh, from that facility as far as uh, observations consistent with what I anticipate you'll hear from those firefighters. Uh, but then uh, there is a certain warming procedure that they go through trying to bring his body temperature up. Because when Mr. O'Keefe arrives at the Good Samaritan Medical Center, his body temperature is 80. Oh. And after those resuscitative efforts prove unsuccessful, Mr. O'Keefe is eventually pronounced by Dr. Rice at approximately 7.15. Shortly after that, when the defendant is then being driven away from the scene by Ms. Roberts, who uh, is now going to go pick up Mr. and Mrs. O'Keefe, Jonathan's parents in Braintree, and then bring them <clears throat> to the Samaritan Medical Center in Brock, uh, the defendant makes some statements uh, of self-harm. As a result of that, she's been transported uh, to the Good Samaritan Medical Center as well uh, by two firefighters named Daniel Whitley and Jason Becker. And amongst the statements that they uh, gained from the defendant as they're having a conversation with her in regard to that, in regard to her treatment and diagnosis, she indicates uh, that the last time uh, that she saw Mr. O'Keefe, they had gotten into an argument before he had gotten out of the car in front of Fair Road. Now, you'll also hear testimony from some... So the last time she saw him, they got in an argument and started get out of the car. They had gotten to an argument before... Uh, ...that she saw Mr. O'Keefe. They had gotten into an argument before he had gotten out of the car in front of Fair Road. Now, you'll also hear testimony from some of the other first responding officers from the camp. Police hey, Kyra, how are you doing today? Department, ...including Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, Sergeant Sean Good, and Sergeant Michael Lent in regard to their initial response, their <coughs> observations, uh, people that they spoke to, where they went, uh, and their ability to recover within these blizzard conditions that are still ongoing, uh, certain pieces of, of evidence that they located in around the area where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found. You will also hear from Lieutenant <coughs> Charles Ray of the Canada Police Department, who was tasked with, at this point in time, uh, the Canada Police were unaware that, uh, that the nephew was over at a sleepover. Uh, they weren't aware that Mr. Camerano had come over to uh, the resident of Meadows Ave and picked up the niece, uh, bringing her back to his house as she was left unattended uh, when the defendant left uh, to go looking for uh, Mr. O'Keefe. So unaware of that, they go do a well-being check at approximately 8.22 in the morning. And they also have a uh, cruiser camera video uh, attached to their cruiser. And you'll see that video. Of, and when they pull into the driveway at Meadows Ave, approximately 8.22 in the morning, they pull in directly behind uh, where eventually you'll hear Ms. McCabe uh, left uh, the defendant's vehicle after driving it from her house to Meadows Ave in search of Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, and you'll have that, uh, foot uh, that footage, and you'll be able to see the back of the defendant's vehicle, specifically the right rear taillight of that vehicle. Now, you'll also hear testimony, as I mentioned, from the Cameranos, uh, from Mr. Roberts, uh, from Mr. So. Also, uh, they were all present uh, with the defendant and Mr. O'Keefe at C.F. McCarthy's. Um, you'll hear testimony from a number, number of other individuals who were at the waterfall. The waterfall is a bar located across uh, the street, essentially. Hey, Reese, how are you doing today? Oh, man, too bad there's no, like, security camera footage or ring camera footage um, on, in the outside of the house or something. From C.F. McCarthy's on Washington Street in Canton Center, and somewhere that Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant went after leaving C.F. McCarthy's at approximately 11 p.m. Now, from 
after that establishment, you'll hear from Rebecca Trayers, who was working as a bartender at the waterfall that evening. You'll hear from a couple uh, named Nicholas and uh, Karina Polakaitis, uh, who were friends of friends, uh, who had known uh, Mr. O'Keefe uh, through their daughter around the same age uh, as, as Mr. O'Keefe. <coughs> Mrs. Uh, Polakaitis had some conversation uh, with the defendant that evening, as well as herself and Mrs. McCabe at the waterfall. She left around the same time as they did. Uh, she parked on Washington Street around uh, the same area as Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed did, specifically in Ms. Reed's car. And she observed Mr. O'Keefe and uh, the defendant walking toward the defendant's vehicle, and specifically the defendant walking towards the driver's side of the vehicle. Now, you'll hear testimony from a Christopher and Julie Albert, uh, who were people who were at one point neighbors of uh, Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, they knew him uh, well from, from being neighbors uh, of him. Uh, Christopher Albert owns a pizza shop, also located within that Cannon Center uh, area. Mr. O'Keefe, earlier in the day of the 28th, had been into that pizza shop along with his nephew to get his nephew a slice. Christopher Albert and Mr. O'Keefe had some conversation regarding what they were doing that night. And it's oh, yes. Uh, yeah, we do true crime and video games here. Mm -hmm. Christopher Albert and Mr. O'Keefe had some conversation regarding what they were doing that night, and it's Christopher Albert who actually texts uh, Mr. O'Keefe and indicates that they're over at the waterfall and that he should come over shortly before <clears throat> Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant make their way from C.F. McCarthy's uh, home. I wish um, he had his own microphone right here. I think the audio that's getting picked up is just like the courtroom mic. That's why it's kind of like blah, 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 but ah, now. But I think when the witnesses go on the stand, I think they have their own microphone, so it sounds like really good. <laughs> yeah i it's it's like the microphone thing um you need to have a microphone in someone's like at someone's mouth that way you can like really listen to them otherwise it sounds a bit like verbal or verbal or now christopher alvin left directly from the waterfall and went also um the hard part about this is that there are so many different people involved that you kind of get lost in all the different names so it's like a lot of people are keeping track of like, okay, Karen Reed, John O'Keefe. But then when he's talking about like other family members and members and members and all that stuff, that's when it's just like, okay, this is a lot of people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a general overview. Um, I feel like it would help to have like a, I don't know, some sort of like maybe a PowerPoint and maybe have the pictures of like people and they're like the family tree because it, there is like a family tree here. Um, there's like the John O'Keefe family tree and then there's also like the friends and then there's also the family tree of the people that are being accused of, you know, framing Karen Reed. It gets pretty complicated. Yeah. Um, there needs to be a presentation and then like you need to have like a little wand or something to point who's who and who's talking about. But we're kind of just getting an overview. At home, there's sort of walking distance way uh, from them. Um, his wife, Julie Albert, had left earlier in the evening. There was a band playing at the waterfall that night. Mrs. Uh, Julie Albert started to get a migraine, and she left. Uh, yeah, it was getting a little bit group. convoluted. So this is at normal speed. Usually when I listen to opening statements, we listen at like 1.5, 1.25. But I was like, no, nah, this is <laughs> this is a, a normal speed opening statement. <laughs> Included within that group and sort of how uh, they came to the waterfall, the Albert family in particular, Julie Alberts uh, went there along with uh, her sister-in-law, Nicole Albert, uh, as well as her uh, niece, Caitlin Albert, her niece's boyfriend, and Mr. Christian Morris, and they had had dinner at the waterfall earlier in that evening. Now, Nicole Albert lives at 34 Fairview Road. She has a husband named Brian Albert, who's also... Okay, now we're getting into the family that um, framed Karen Reed. That's what the defense is alleging. Nicole Albert lives at 34 Fairview Road. She has a husband named Brian Albert, who's also a Boston police officer. Uh, Brian Albert had gone uh, with a friend of his, who's also in law enforcement, a, name, a man named Brian Higgins. And they had gone uh, separately, but had come home together uh, from a funeral for a uh, fallen uh, police officer in New York City. Came home early to sort of beat the weather, and eventually they meet up with Brian Albert's family at the waterfall. Now, Tristan Morris, who was Caitlin Albert's boyfriend, uh, had left the waterfall at some point in the evening. He then returns later to the residence on Fairview Road and picks up Caitlin Albert, brings him home. All of this is in relation to Brian Albert and Nicole Albert's son, Brian Albert Jr., uh, whose birthday was coming up the following day, the day of the snowstorm on the 29th. So he had been back at the house at 34 Fairview while uh, his family was out at the waterfall. Uh, he had a number of friends that had come over uh, that evening to celebrate his birthday with him. 
Now, among those friends was uh, two individuals named Sarah Levinson and Julie Nagel, and they were at the residence at 34 Fairview for a good portion. Now, those individuals from the waterfall that leave and then come uh, to 34 Fairview, they do so sometime shortly after midnight. Shortly after midnight is when it starts to snow. Flurries are starting to come down. Snow is starting to stick to some degree to roads, to the front lawns, to grassy areas uh, around the town. Uh, this is my understanding. Um, so Karen Reed, um, so like basically they were like celebrating for John O'Keefe's niece and like a friend got into a private school. And I think they were like kind of all celebrating that night. Um, but John O'Keefe and like his friends, I think they went to the bar. Karen Reed joins them afterwards and they're all kind of hanging out at this bar. Right. And then the other couple that they were hanging out with was like, hey, let's go back to my sister's house and let's go get some drinks there. Let's just hang out there. So they like, I don't know if they went bar hopping and then they went to the sister's house, but they eventually all left and headed towards the sister's house. And that's when Karen Reed, I guess, got an argument with John O'Keefe. So they're arguing in the car, da, 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 da. And they're supposed to meet up their couple friends um, who's like, it's like the sister's house. So that's 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 all i'm getting right now but within that house within that house so within the house there's like you know there's like mom dad and the son is also celebrating his birthday there he's celebrating i don't know it was like 18th birthday i don't know what he mentioned that but he's selling his birthday birthday there and he has like some two friends that are also there so we have just more witnesses <laughs> more witnesses okay now also, I think it's really important that he mentions when the snow starts. So apparently it was a blizzard. It was really cold. Lots of snow came down. But what he mentioned earlier in his opening statement was that John O'Keefe's body had six inches of snow on top of him. Underneath him was just grass and a cell phone that his body was just on top of. So I think it's really important to figure out, OK, did Karen drop off the boyfriend? And this is when it was about to snow. And then she hits him. He lands into the ground and then he dies or he's like injured. He can't get up and he kind of just like freezes to death. Right. Um, or did he actually go inside the house? It's already snowing, 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 snowing. He's inside the house. Something went down where a bunch of people turn against him. They beat the shit out of him or whatever. The dog attacks him. Da, 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 da. And then they just discard his body in front of their house. Because I think that part's really important because, you know, if let's say he was there for a couple of hours and then they toss him out, well, wouldn't there be a couple of inches of snow beneath him? Um, how, how fast was it snowing? Was the snow like, you know, was it, was it, was it accruing or was it like melting as it went? It seems like there was like a good amount of snow and it was like cold enough for the snow to actually stick and to continue piling on. Um, so I think that's why he keeps mentioning like, okay, when the snow started and then like the body and all that stuff. But yeah, his tone is a little bit, I feel like he could have went, he could have started this with a banger. <laughs> From that group. The group that goes back is obviously Brian Albert and Nicole Albert, as they live there. Caitlin Albert, uh, because it's her parents and her boyfriend is picking her up. As well as uh, Jennifer McCabe, who is Nicole Albert's sister, uh, and her husband, Matthew. And I think Jennifer McCabe, oh God, should I, just, I should just draw a family tree for this one. I think Jennifer McCabe was the one who was hanging out with John O'Keefe and Karen O'Keefe at the bar. She's the sister. Hold on. Um... There, Caitlin Albert, around the town. Now, from that group, the group that goes back is obviously Brian Albert and Nicole Albert as they live there. Caitlin Albert. Brian Albert. So Brian Albert, Nicole Albert go back to the house. Okay, because they live there. They live there. Oh, you know what? I think I can find a hold on a second. The Karen Reed trial family tree i i feel like we went over this in a family tree before in a previous stream oh court tv i love you oh we got the the court tv graphic here um okay so here's court tv these are the people that live in the house so we have brian and nicole albert who are these two right here i don't know how to make this bigger plus 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 plus, plus like that oh no that made it worse <laughs> Okay, so Brian, Nicole Albert, they live in the house, okay? They have two kids. Now, Brian Albert Jr., it was his birthday. He was celebrating his birthday there. He had some friends over at the house celebrating the birthday. So we have more witnesses, okay? So now outside of the house, 
we have Jennifer McCabe and Matt McCabe. I believe those were the couple that that was a couple that was hanging out with Karen Reed and John O'Keefe at the bar. So they're at the bar drinking and then Jennifer's like, hey, let's go to my sister's house. You know, um, let's go get some drinks there. I don't know. Was Brian Albert, uh, was Brian and Nicole already there? Maybe because I think he said they went from Waterfall, which I think is a bar and went back to the house. So it seems like they're all hanging out and then they all go back to the house. All right. So <laughs> we'll keep referring to this, this chart right here. They, they should have hit up Court TV for a chart, man. Albert, uh, because it's her parents and her boyfriend is picking her up, as well as uh, Jennifer McCabe, who is Nicole Albert's sister. Uh, and her husband, Matthew. Um, they go back to that, and there's an open invitation to essentially anybody that's there. Um, John O'Keefe takes them up on that. There's certain text messages and phone conversations between John O'Keefe and Jennifer McCabe as to where this house is located, as he's never been there before. Uh, and then he and the defendant drive in the defendant's vehicle to 34 Fairview. <clears throat> and once there, there are several witnesses from within the home that observe uh, the vehicle parked in. So I mentioned earlier there are two uh, females that were with Brian Albert Jr. at the house, one of them being Julie Nick. At some point, she had called her brother, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, for a ride home. He then gets a ride from his friend, uh, Ricky D'Antonio, uh, as well as uh, his Mr. Nagel's girlfriend, Heather Max, uh, that's riding in the back of Mr. D'Antonio's uh, pickup truck. I say that because they arrive at... Fairview Road around the same time as the defendant. The defendant is coming in from one direction. The pickup truck with the Nagel brother is coming in from another direction. The pickup truck that the Nagel brother is riding in flashes its light, signaling the defendant to go. She goes first. They fall in behind, and lo and behold, they end up at the same house. They park the pickup truck somewhere in that right side of the property, facing it from the street in the area of the driveway. And the defendant in her black Lexus SUV parks a little bit further up. Different people from within the picture. Ah, uh, okay. So he mentioned this before, too, in the opening statement. He was talking about how uh, when Karen Reed and her two friends showed up the next day when John O'Keefe's body was already found, uh, was found dead uh, in the snow, it was, like, on the left side of the house. So now he's talking about, okay, well, her car was also on the left side of the house. The people that were picking up the sister inside the house, they were on about the right side of the house. And different people from within the house Kevin. observed that Lexus SUV in one location pull up a little bit further, and then pull up a little bit further until it's in the area of that fire hydrant, of that flagpole, uh, where Mr. O'Keefe is located uh, the following morning. Now, <clears throat> from their position, I anticipate the testimony that you're going to hear is that Heather Maxson from that pickup truck observes uh, a male passenger and a female operator when the pickup truck operator flashes those lights that the vehicle is facing each other before they pull down there. What you'll hear also, I anticipate, from uh, all three of those individuals in the pickup, and Julie Nagel who comes out to the pickup to talk to the brother, uh, is that no one ever exits that vehicle. There are no footprints around that vehicle. There's no damage that they observed to that vehicle at that time. Again, it's just started to snow. Things aren't sticking uh, really too much at this point. Julie Nagel has a conversation with the brother, decides if she's going to... Uh, so it's beginning a snow, um, so it's not really sticking too much. Okay. Really too much at this point. Louis Nagel has a conversation with her brother, decides if she's going to uh, stay at the house longer, so the arrangements for a ride home, uh, and the pickup truck leaves uh, from that point. As they pass by, they observe a uh, female operator uh, matching what I submit as the description of the film. So I'm sticking uh, really too much at this point. Louis Nagel has a conversation with her brother, decides if she's going to uh, stay at the house longer, so the arrangements for a ride home, uh, and the pickup truck leaves uh, from that point. As they pass by, they observe a uh, female operator uh, matching what I submit as the description of the defendant. From all of those people within that house that evening, none of them at any point in time observed John O'Keefe come into the house. They see the vehicle out front, they see the vehicle pull away, and they just assume that they left. Oh man, this is okay. This is sounding good for the state so far. Oh man. Can't wait for the defense to go. And that no one was coming. Clear testimony from other individuals who were at the house uh, that night, including uh, Colin Albert, who was.
I mean, here's the thing, though. I think there are times where people are just really bad presenters. But once they get up on there and start asking the witnesses questions, they're like doing their thing. They're in their jive. I think it's just hard to present sometimes, especially when there's like so many people involved. And like, if you don't know anything or like, you know, a little bit about the case, you're just like, OK, okay this nephew. OK. Oh, there's a junior. here. OK. Friend of a friend, niece of a nephew. Oh, OK, there's just too many people here. You know, it gets really confusing. But I do think that, you know, it's possible when he starts getting in his role, when he starts asking questions, um, maybe he'll get better. Um, Cause I do see a lot in trials where we listen to opening statements. I'm just like, okay, this opening statement sucks. But then once we get to the direct examination, the cross examination, I'm like, okay, like this is, they're doing a good job. Julian Christopher Albert's son, he's also the cousin. We hear testimony from other individuals who were at the house uh, that night, including uh, Colin Albert, who was- um, Okay. <laughs> What was he talking about just now? Anyone, a tow truck, two sides of the house, question mark, question mark. Okay, so um, the people in the house, their son was having a birthday party, okay? One of the friend was a girl, and she was like, eh, maybe I should leave. So she hits up her brother. Her brother drives a pickup truck. Her brother and his friends come to pick her up. And when they're on their way there, they are also noticing Karen Reed's car. So Karen's Reed car is also heading to the house. And they realize that the car... The Karen Reed car is parked on the left side. The left side is where John O'Keefe's body is found. Um, not only that, but they don't notice anyone getting out of the car. Because remember, Karen Reed's story is that, oh, I dropped off my boyfriend at the house. And that's where he got murdered, killed, or whatever happened, right? Um, no one gets out of the car. It's just the two of them. It seems like they're just in the car probably talking, right? And so the girl who initially asked her brother for a ride was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay here. Actually, I'm just going to hang out here. I'll figure out my ride later on, whatever. And so they leave. And they noticed that, you know, Karen Reed is still in the car with, like, the, the boyfriend, John O'Keefe. That's where we're at right now. Julian Christopher Albert's son. He's also the cousin. We hear testimony from other individuals who were at the house uh, that night, including uh, Colin Albert, who is Julian Christopher Albert's son. He's also the cousin of Brian Albert Jr., who is having people over. First. Okay, now. <laughs> who? Who? Who was this? Fuck, I, I might need to slow him down a little bit. He said. Oh, God, now he's no. We hear testimony from other individuals who were at the house uh, that night. OK, so other people at house. So what he's essentially saying is that there was a fuck ton of people at this house and no one saw Joan O'Keefe come into the house. So in order for this framing to work, everyone would have to be in on this. But it's possible they could all be honest if they all were participating in murdering John O'Keefe. I don't know. Including uh, Colin Albert, who is Julie and Christopher Albert's son. He's also Julie and Albert's son. Um, Julie and Albert's son. Oh, Colin Albert. Okay, so now we're talking about the extended family. So this is the homeowners. All right, Brian Albert is brothers with Chris Albert who's married to Julie Albert and their son is Colin Albert. Okay. <laughs> so we have, oh, oh Lord. We have Julie Albert. We have Chris Albert, son, Colin Albert. No way in hell the jury's following this. They're probably just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. They're probably getting like, just like the important information that stands out to them. But when it comes to all this mumbo jumbo, they're probably just as lost as we are. <laughs> Also, my uh, my internet's not happy right now. Hello, or not my internet, but my mouse. Hello. Why are you not happy right now? Just be happy. Cousin of Brian Albert Jr. was having people over for his birthday. Okay. He's leaving the house around the time that the initial people coming back from the waterfall, which includes the homeowners uh, and Mr. Higgins, are sort of coming into the house. At that point, uh, Colin Albert was leaving. He's getting picked up by young lady named Alice in the cave, who is Jennifer and Matthew McCabe's um, daughter, who's also friends with Colin Albert and also cousins of his daughter. Okay, so they're cousins and they're friends. Okay, this is who he's talking about, Colin Albert and Jennifer McCabe's uh, daughter. Brian Albert Jr. who's within the home celebrating this birthday. As I mentioned, you'll hear testimony from Matthew McCabe and from Jennifer McCabe in regard to their observations that particular evening, uh, both at the waterfall as well as uh, at the residence on Sarah View Road. And then you'll hear testimony in regard to a phone call. A phone call that Jennifer McCabe uh, receives from John O'Keefe's niece at approximately 4.53 in the morning. 
She answers that phone call, speaks to the niece briefly, and the niece hands the phone over to the defendant. Now, you'll hear testimony from uh, the niece as well uh, that about 4.30 in the morning or so, the defendant came into uh, her room uh, in a frantic state, uh, saying that uh, Mr. O'Keefe had not come home the night before. So initially... Uh, so are they trying to get into John O'Keefe being um, unfaithful to Karen Reed, or maybe he just didn't come home, and that maybe their relationship is unstable? I think that's maybe where we're heading at. When the defendant is talking to Ms. McCabe, she indicates to Ms. McCabe that the last time she saw Ms. O'Keefe was at the waterfall. Eventually, as Ms. McCabe is waking up, she reminds uh, the defendant that she not only saw them leave the waterfall around the same time as herself, but also saw the vehicle, uh, the defendant's vehicle, outside of the home on Fairview Road. Eventually... No, just kidding. Uh, erase what I just said. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where he's going with this. I'm a little confused. Um, maybe he's trying to say that Karen's lying. Okay, sorry. Let's just listen to this. Maybe you guys can help me out. Uh, her room uh, in a frantic state, uh, saying that uh, Mr. O'Keefe had not come home the night before. So initially, when the defendant is talking to Ms. McCabe, she indicates to Ms. McCabe that the last time she saw Mr. O'Keefe was at the waterfall. Eventually, as Ms. McCabe is waking up, she reminds uh, the defendant that she not only saw them leave the waterfall around the same time as herself, but also saw the vehicle, uh, the defendant's vehicle, outside of the home on Fairview Road. Eventually, the defendant, while driving around, and this will come in as far as other testimony and related testimony uh, as it develops, but she's driving around in that morning. She's calling a bunch of a uh, number of different people, friends of, of Mr. O'Keefe. She's calling Mr. O'Keefe himself. She also calls uh, Ms. Roberts. So Kelly Roberts receives a call. About yeah, so what I think uh, where we're at right now is that um, this is after the alleged murder happened her running over john o'keefe right or hitting him with the car so she's saying that i guess do they all live in the house together or something in a different house sorry so the niece is trying to get in touch of the victim jennifer mccabe answers the call and then she gives the phone to karen reed karen reed later on comes into the room and she's frantic she's like oh my god john didn't come home john didn't come home However, I think he said that Karen told Jennifer McCabe that the last time she saw John was at the waterfall. I think that's what he said right there. He said it so quickly. She said that she saw him leave the waterfall, which wouldn't make sense because it seems like Karen and John were driving together to the house. So maybe that's him trying to say that like, oh, you know, initially she said that she saw him leave at the waterfall. When we all know the last time she saw him was actually in front of the house where he was allegedly murdered at. About 5 a.m. from the defendant indicating uh, that Mr. O'Keefe did not come home, indicating that he got hit by a plow or that he must be dead. Ms. Roberts then gets ready. Mr. Cave is getting ready as they're all sort of planning to go out and, and look for Mr. O'Keefe to see if they can locate him. They call numerous times and you see that within the... And she said he was, that he didn't come home because he got hit with a plow? Oh, that's very specific calling a bunch of a uh, number of different people, friends of, of Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, she's calling Mr. O'Keefe himself. She also calls uh, Ms. Roberts. So Kelly Roberts receives a call about 5 a.m. from the defendant indicating uh, that Mr. O'Keefe did not come home, indicating that he got hit by a plow or that he must... Oh, that is kind of weird if Kevin... That would be really weird if Karen Reed was calling people and then told them, like, oh, he didn't come home. I guess he got hit by the snow plow. <laughs> Why would you go to that as your conclusion that he got hit by a snowplow? Ooh, that is that is weird. Hi, Mad Hatter. Yeah, to the party. Karen was like calling all these people. Ooh, not looking good, Karen. Must be dead. And he must be dead. Miss Roberts then gets ready. Mr. Cave is getting ready as they're all sort of planning to go out and, and look for Mr. O'Keefe to see if they can locate him. They call numerous times and you see that within the text messages and the phone attractions from a variety of people's different phones. Throughout the course of this trial as well. So eventually the defendant comes to Ms. McCabe's home, um, indicates at some point uh, prior to that that she has cracked health. 
Ms. McCabe then gets in the driver's seat uh, due to the defendant's frantic state. Ms. Roberts is there as well. Ms. Roberts follows Ms. McCabe driving the defendant's vehicle back to Mr. O'Keefe's residence on Meadows Ave, checks on the niece. Uh, the defendant then shows uh, both Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe uh, the damage to her right rear taillight, which is... Oh, no. I wonder if Karen was like... Let's say if she did do this, right? I wonder if Karen was trying to figure out and navigate what to do next like she's like okay well let me see if i can plant some stories out there maybe you got hit by a snow plow oh you must be dead out there oh you know the last time i saw him was at the waterfall but at the same time she wanted to make it seem like she wasn't the obvious suspect and usually obvious suspects wouldn't be like look at my broken tail light <laughs> i don't know or maybe she was thinking about okay maybe i should turn myself in if she did commit it actually missing a uh, number of different pieces uh, from that right rear. But believe me, Karen's lawyers are going to hit hard and sound more believable. Oh, I've, 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 I've had a preview of their arguments. Oh, I had a preview of it. Uh, both Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe, uh, the uh, damage to her right rear taillight, which is uh, essentially missing a uh, number of different pieces uh, from that right rear taillight. And pieces of right rear taillight, is it going to be found at the house? They then proceed off uh, to drive and see if where they can if they can locate Mr. O'Keefe. Defendant is insistent that they go to that residence on Syracuse Road. Uh, again, they're driving down there in the dark, in the snow, in the wind, in the blizzard. As they approach uh, towards that residence, there is Are they saying she ran him over? Correcto mundo. They are saying that Karen Reed got an argument with the boyfriend, something must have went down, and she like hit him with the car and then she just drove off. Went home, slept it off, and then the next day was like, oh, my God, John didn't come home. I wonder what happened. That's the state side of the story. Wait until you hear the defense side of the story. Hi, Storm. What's up? How are you doing today? Oh, the trash people are here. There's one person. Um, so they're seated within the vehicle. And this is Miss Roberts. vehicle. She's driving. This is McCabe is in the front passenger seat. And the defendant is in the rear passenger seat. The defendant is the only one who sees Mr. O'Keefe. He yells and screams at Miss Roberts to stop the vehicle. Roberts and Ms. McCabe, I anticipate, will testify that they did Oh, no. So they're going to say that, like, oh, she already knew where the body was. <laughs> okay. So they're all, three of them are driving the vehicle together, and she's in the back seat. And then as they're driving up, she's like, oh, there's his body. However, the people that were sitting in the front, I guess, didn't see his body. So they're trying to insinuate that, like, oh, she already knew where his body was. Hmm. That residence, there was one person. Uh, so they're seated within the vehicle. This is Ms. Roberts' vehicle. She's driving. This is McCabe is in the front passenger seat, and the defendant is in the rear passenger seat. The defendant is the only one who sees Mr. O'Keefe. He yells and screams at Ms. Roberts to stop the deal. Ms. Roberts and Ms. McCabe, I anticipate, will testify that they did not see Mr. O'Keefe, not only as they were driving past him, but even after they got out of the vehicle until the defendant gets out of the back seat and makes a beeline essentially right over to where Mr. O'Keefe's car was found. This is McCabe, then uh, dials 911. Uh, and shortly after that is when the officers and the firefighters uh, arrive on scene. Now, <clears throat> while they're waiting there... Sorry, just want to get one fine. more thing. This is McCabe, uh, then dials 911. Mr. O'Keefe's father then gets out of the back seat. They were driving past him, but he they will testify that they did not see Mr. O'Keefe. Not only as they were driving past him, but even after they got out of the vehicle until the defendant gets out of the back seat and makes a beeline essentially right over to where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found. Okay, so they never even saw the body. All right, and she does that one. Okay. Now, <clears throat> while they're waiting there, at approximately 6.23, 6.24 a.m., uh, during the conversation uh, with the defendant, the defendant uh, asks uh, Ms. McCabe to uh, look up on her phone how long someone has to be out in the cold uh, to die from hypothermia. Or something to that effect. And you'll hear some dispute as to when that uh, search was made. And yes, why is there a dispute? Why do we not have a, an agreed time? So the state obviously said that, you know, how long someone has to be in the cold to die of hypothermia, right? Um, that was something that was searched. They said it was after the body died, after, um, after his body was found. However, I guess the defense is saying that, like, no, that happened before. But why, why is this being, why, 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 why? Something to that effect. And you'll hear some dispute as to when that uh, search was made. And that you'll hear testimony from three different friends of attraction experts, as you Nicholas Carino, Ms. Jessica Hyde, and Mr. Ian Whitford, who uh, you'll hear about a lot of these things called extraction reports uh, from cell phones. 
And the extraction reports are done with a program called Celebrate. Okay. Mr. Griffin is someone who writes that software for Celebrate. I anticipate you'll hear from each of their testimonies that that Google search that was done on Ms. McCabe's phone was done at the same time frame that she indicates the defendant requested her to do it, and that at 6.23 and 6.24 morning. Oh, so Karen Reed requested that Google search? You'll hear testimony from Ms. Roberts, Ms. McCabe, the firefighters, and the responding uh, Kent police officers about a repeated phraseology uh, that the defendant uh, stated while there, asking again and again uh, in regard to Mr. Ortiz, is he dead? Is he dead? You will also Why is that a bad thing? If she kept asking, is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? I, I, I don't know. To me, that's not weird. Also, uh, your testimony, as I indicated, about sort of treatment that she received at the Good Samaritan Medical Center. Maybe it was like said in a weird way. I don't know. We got to see the body cam footage. And that would involve testimony of Ms. Daisy Ormsef, Ms. Kathleen Wilford, and the Dr. Gary Fowler. Uh, your testimony from a number of different analysts uh, from the State Police Crime Lab and from some other uh, laboratories as well. Um, included within that will be a Mr. Nicholas Roberts, a Ms. Maureen Hartnett, a Mr. Andre Porto, a Ms. Ashley Vallier, and a, uh, Ms. Uh, Christina Hamp, uh, those all being from the State Police Lab. You will hear testimony uh, in regard <clears throat> to an incident which occurred earlier uh, in January, right around New Year's. Oh, do we have history of abuse? Uh, Mr. O'Keefe, <coughs> defendant, and the children have been invited with a much larger group, approximately <coughs> 70 people or so, to uh, spend New Year's. By in Karen Reed, not by the defendant. In Aruba. Uh, this is a trip that was organized by a friend of Mr. O'Keefe's named Laura Sullivan. Uh, we hear a testimony from her, as well as from her sister, uh, Miss Marietta Sullivan, as well as you'll hear testimony from uh, two children in relation to this. And Essentially, day two or so of this trip, uh, Marietta Sullivan, the sister of Laura, is walking through the lobby and she runs into Mr. O'Keefe. This is someone she refers to as godfather because John O'Keefe is also the godfather of Laura Sullivan's uh, son. <laughs> runs into him in the lobby, uh, gives him a hug, and is sort of pointing him in the direction of, of where she believes he's going into his room. The defendant is in the area. The defendant starts yelling and screaming and swearing uh, at Ms. Sullivan. Okay. Ms. Sullivan responds in kind. Uh, essentially, for the most part, uh, the Sullivan sisters uh, see very little of uh, Mr. O'Keefe uh, throughout the remainder of their trip uh, to Ruba. And we also hear testimony from the children that shortly after this, or immediately after this, uh, there is an approximately 20 minute screaming match uh, going on between Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant within their hotel room in front okay. of the children. Okay. Now you'll also hear. Testimony. Have I followed the whole Turtle stuff? Um, I heard about him in back in like, was it in December when they arrested him for like witness intimidation or something? <laughs> I know he's not in the courtroom right now. <laughs> from the defendant's uh, phone. But that's like a, like a diehard Karen Reed supporter, right? Um, but yeah. Watching this this morning was rough for you. Hello, how are you doing today? Also, um, if it's just like her yelling and shouting and them like arguing with each other. I don't see what the big deal is unless they're trying to show history of Karen Reed being like completely unhinged and like attacking him and hitting him and stuff like that. Maybe we'll get there. In regard to from uh, another individual's phone, in regard to that Aruba trip, in regard to text messages of an amorous nature that she had uh, with Mr. Brian Higgins, who was at the waterfall and also at the residence on 34 Fairview because he was friends with his homeowner, uh, Brian Albert, but he was also friends with Mr. O'Keefe and had also met uh, the defendant. And throughout the course of those amorous text messages. It's a whole mess. Mm-hmm. This, uh, there is so much going down. There's so much trial, so much publicity about this trial. Oh, my Lord. There is uh, references that the defendant makes to uh, that incident in Aruba, as she uh, purports it to be uh, Mr. O'Keefe cheating on her. Uh, she insists oh, that... Oh, that's why they're bringing it up. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So not, they're not trying to bring up history of, like, abuse, or maybe he'll get there, but, like, they're trying to bring up that, like, oh, you know, John O'Keefe and Karen Reed, they were arguing the day of his murder because she thought he was cheating on her. So that's why he's bringing this part up right now, this argument, this shouting match. That he was making out with Mary Sullivan in that lobby as opposed to uh, her giving him a hug. What? And makes repeated reference uh, to that within the contents of uh, those text messages uh, as well. 
Now, you'll hear testimony from a number of different other individuals, Mr. Michael Trotter, uh, who has a supervisory role with Canton Department of Public Works. You'll hear from Mr. Louis Jutris, uh, who has a supervisory role with regard to IT. Wait, hold on a second. This happened in the hotel. I wonder if the hotel lobby has the, uh, <laughs> is there footage? Nah, it's probably raced by then, though. They usually don't keep footage for that long. In um, regard to certain uh, video uh, that was recovered uh, from the town of Canton, as well as from a uh, temple located. Hi along the route that the defendant traveled, uh, both away from Fairview that evening, as well as uh, to Fairview from the waterfall, away from Fairview uh, to Mr. O'Keefe's residence on Meadows. Oh no, did she take a really weird route back home? And then later in the morning uh, at five, because if you recall, uh, Ms. McCabe, I anticipate, would testify that she receives the call from the defendant about 4.53 in the morning. Uh, the defendant uh, then drives around Canton for some perceptible half hour or so period of time prior to even getting to Ms. McCabe's. And <clears throat> what I submit the evidence or what I anticipate the evidence will show based on sort of the tracking of her phone records, so testimony you'll hear from Lieutenant Brian Cullow of the state police uh, from these bulky records and RTT accounts, uh, that the defendant, while she's using her phone, is uh, driving in the direction of Fairview Road prior to going to Mrs. McCabe's house where she meets Mrs. McCabe and Ms. Roberts. Uh, so does it make it look like, like, I think they're trying to say that like, it looks like Karen was about to drive to the Fairview home where John's body was found, but then was like taken a long winded way going to other places. And then she ended up going to Jennifer McCabe's house. Hmm. Or maybe, I guess it depends on where she went. What if she went to the houses of the people that she thought John O'Keefe was like cheating with or something? I don't know. She took the Wendy Adelson route. <laughs> well, let's see what the defense again, explanation is. There, there could be a good explanation for this. You'll hear testimony from a number of different uh, troopers who were involved in the investigation. Uh, with regard to this case, you'll hear from Trooper Michael Proctor and Sergeant Jury Mechanic of the State Police. Uh, you'll hear from Lieutenant Brian Tull. You'll hear some testimony from Trooper Joseph Hall, who's in a specialized unit within the State Police called for short, but essentially a collision analysis and reconstruction section uh, within the Massachusetts State Police. His examination of the vehicle, his examination of the scene, his examination of specifically some Toyota texture, because Lexus is uh, essentially owned by Toyota or vice versa. Uh, so there is some data that he's able to recover from that and back the vehicle up based on its known locations and travel. He cycles and essentially opines, uh, anticipate he'll opine that uh, around 1245 uh, in the morning when the vehicle was in front of the residence on Fairview, that for some perceptible period of time, that vehicle travels over 60 feet in reverse at over 20, approximately 24.2 miles per hour. <clears throat> now, you'll hear testimony, as I said, from a number of uh, different uh, troopers, as well as uh, from a number of different analysts uh, from different labs. Included within that is Ms. Maureen Hartnett. Uh, who collected items uh, from the vehicle, uh, the defendant's vehicle, including the taillights, uh, sort of housing from that vehicle, pieces of the taillight that were discovered. Uh, oh, they got pieces, okay. And sort of front grass, front street area. Uh, there is a, a specialized team called CERT team. Uh, you'll hear from Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara, uh, who has a supervisory role in relation to that. And then later on that day of the 29th, he, along with Lieutenant Tully and a number of different members uh, from his CERT team, were searching for evidence within the mounds of snow uh, in front of that house as the blizzard is still ongoing at this point through sort of the afternoon hours. Among the items that they locate is a sneaker. When Mr. O'Keefe is transported to the hospital, he's found to only have one sneaker on his, on his feet. They find the other sneaker uh, in that area of the body. They find uh, various pieces of taillight. And as is wont to do uh, over the course of the following days, uh, the temperatures rise, uh, the rainstorm that comes in, and the snow melts. Over those successive days, there are additional pieces of taillights uh, that are eventually discovered in that area of the front lawn. Ooh. Ooh, the taillight thing. Not looking good. Three. Now, <clears throat> from these uh, different pieces, um, Ms. Harden also uh, locates a cocktail glass. Oh, you know what? Wait, hold on a second. Did she ever explain the taillight? I actually don't know if she explains the taillight or not. Uh, or maybe she did, but like. I feel like she could say that he punched the taillight out because he was so pissed at her. Uh, that's located on the bumper uh, or the rear uh, area of that seat. Hey, a radio check. Thank you so much for the follow. How are you doing today? Thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. And then she locates a uh, human hair on the back of that uh, defendant's vehicle as well. Now, hair. the cocktail glass on the bumper 
You'll also see uh, surveillance video from the waterfall. And Mr. O'Keefe is observed on that surveillance video, essentially walking out of the waterfall with a cocktail glass in his right hand. Oh, okay. I was like, what is a cocktail? Oh, cocktail glass. Oh, my gosh. I kept hearing cocktail brass. I was like, what is a cocktail brass? Initially, I thought he was talking about something with like a car or something. Okay, wait, he, he, he left the bar with a cocktail glass. Oh man, that's a Vegas thing. Uh, area of that scene, and she locates a uh, human hair on the back of that uh, defendant's vehicle as well. Okay, the human now, hair, what's important to that? cocktail glass on the bumper, you'll also see uh, surveillance video from the waterfall. And Mr. O'Keefe is observed on that surveillance video, essentially walking out of the waterfall with a cocktail glass in his right hand. Same right hand uh, that has uh, minor injuries to it, and the same right hand that's attached to his right arm that has the abrasions and lacerations oh. uh, that are observed uh, by the paramedics, that are observed by the doctors at Good Samaritan, and are observed uh, by the medical examiner as well. We'll hear testimony from another analyst, like Christina Hanley, about the forensic uh, consistency between a drinking glass that was in the defendant's bumper and the drinking glass pieces uh, that were found uh, on scene in the 34th Fair. You'll hear uh, her testimony in regard to uh, pieces of red and clear plastic that were microscopic in size that were found within Mr. O'Keefe's clothing. Consistent, uh, in her opinion, I anticipate she'll testify with the same pieces of plastic contained within the defendant's tail. Mm. The tail light, they say she hit John's car backing out of the driveway of the driveway of 34 um, Fairview where his body was found. But the tail light's the easiest part to plant. We'll hear from an Ashley Valley uh, who works for the lab as well. Uh, I mean, honestly, if this is like a whole conspiracy um, cover up, it's going to be I feel like it's going to be really easy to unravel all of this because it's hard to have a bunch of people be in on something and to not slip to either, you know, it's hard to like keep your story straight, like completely straight and like consistent with each other. Um, this is a lot of people that would have to be in on this. It's the people that were in the house, um, some of the teenagers, and then also like a whole ass police department. And how she fit the various pieces of broken taillight from the scene together and over that taillight housing, uh, finding them to be consistent with each other as well. You'll hear testimony from Andre Porto, who's the, uh, essentially DNA analyst uh, for the lab. And samples that were Wait, who's the judge? How's the judge connected? Does, <laughs> why is the judge connected? Wouldn't they be recused? Uh, DNA samples that were taken from the taillight, from the clothes of Mr. O'Keefe, uh, and the broken drinking glass uh, that were consistent uh, with Mr. O'Keefe. Those items were also sent, uh, the taillight leases, uh, the taillight uh, DNA was also sent to an independent lab. How, how is she connected? Uh, is it like family members or anything like that? Or... Uh, voting technologies located in Northern Virginia. And you'll hear from an analyst there, Mr. Nicholas Bradford, indicating that the uh, DNA on the defendant's taillight, uh, in his opinion, is consistent with that. Oh, at John's house when she went home to sleep. Okay. But then there are fragments found in front of the house, though, where John's body was found. Of uh, Mr. O'Keefe, and inconsistent with Trooper She's Fox. saying that those were planted? Dr. Sergeant Buchanan, uh, that the uh, DNA on the defendant's taillight his opinion is consistent with that of Mr. O'Keefe and inconsistent with Trooper Proctor and Sergeant Buchanan, uh, who were the two preliminary investigators uh, and primary investigators when it came to this case. You'll also hear from this test chart from that Bodhi <coughs> Laboratories in regard to some mitochondrial DNA uh, that she uh, examined in regard to that hair uh, that Ms. Hartnett found on the bumper of the car and her opinion that it was consistent with that of Mr. O'Keefe as well. And lastly, you'll also hear from Dr. Irene Sportibello and Dr. Reed. Oh, wait, hold on. I just got this, like, uh, it says, like, the Turtle Boy guy can attend the Karen Reed murder trial. Is he in there? A stone bridge of the Oxford Chief Medical Team in regard to there are various examinations. Uh, Dr. Stonebridge is a neuropathologist. She essentially examines uh, brain findings. Dr. Arini Sportibello is a forensic pathologist uh, who uh, does the sort of uh, autopsy and medical examination of Mr. O'Keefe's body. And you'll hear about the variety of sort of injuries that she observed over Mr. O'Keefe's body um, from 
In particular, you'll hear testimony in regards to lacerations to the right back of his head. You'll hear testimony in regards to an initial sort of skull fracture that occurs to the back of his head, and then sort of a radiating skull fracture that goes uh, throughout uh, his skull. This then leads to a subdural hemorrhage, or essentially bleeding uh, on the brain and then swelling of the brain, which then causes a condition called echinosis, uh, which then sort of leads to the swelling of uh, both the Mr. O's eyes that was observed uh, by the initial respondents. You will hear uh, various testimony about uh, sort of issues in regards to the pancreas and how that's indicative of hypothalamus. Now, again, as I said, this is the first of two times that uh, I have an opportunity to, uh, to address you directly. And I thank you very much for your attention today. And I hey, thank Norm, you for how are you doing today? Your close attention as we go through all of the witnesses and all the evidence in this case. That second time that I do get to address you, what I'll be asking you to do, based on the evidence, and again, as the board has instructed you, you are the sole arbiters of the facts of this case. You are the ones who find what the facts, and I reiterate that, the facts and what the evidence uh, demonstrates in this case. And what I submit to you at that time, that second time, is that the only true and just verdict based on that evidence is that the defendant, Karen Reed, is guilty of murder in the second degree, striking the, uh, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, with a car, knocking him back onto the ground, striking his head on the ground, causing the bleeding in his brain, swelling, and then leaving him there for several hours in a blizzard with temperatures in the teens, wind swirling around, snow piling up on his body, until she comes uh, with Mrs. McCabe and Mrs. Roberts uh, just after 6 a.m. And that she is also guilty of vehicular manslaughter, um, operating under the influence of liquor, and that she is also guilty of leaving the scene after causing death. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lally. Mr. Betty? Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Now we have the defense. That was, that was, I don't know. Hopefully the defense will make it very clear cut and <laughs> we'll see. Defense opening. Oh, well, thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're doing good. We're just covering the Karen Reed trial. This is um, opening statements right now. And I want to see what the defense is going to say. Karen Reed was framed. Good start. Her car never struck John O'Keefe. She did not cause his death. And that means that somebody else did. Okay. You will learn that it was no accident that John O'Keefe was found dead on the front lawn of 34 Fairview Road in the camp on January 29th of 2022. You will the defense was why I was having a rough time this morning. Wait, why? Learn that at that address lived a well-known and well-connected law enforcement family in Canton, mm -hmm. the Alberts. Because the Alberts were involved and because they had close connections to the investigators in this case, Karen Reed was framed for a murder she did not commit. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. As I previously told you, my name is David Yannetti. Hello, I'm an David. attorney with an office in Boston. Together with attorneys Alan Jackson and Elizabeth Little, it's truly my privilege and my honor to represent Karen Reed during this trial. From a very early juncture in this case, you will question the Commonwealth's theory of the case. You will question the quality of the Commonwealth's evidence. You will question the veracity of the Commonwealth's witnesses. And you will question their shoddy and biased investigation, a faulty investigation that led to Karen Reed sitting here today. You will learn, in short, that the police did no real investigation of this case, and you will question why. You'll question why the investigators had such tunnel vision. You'll question why they focused solely on Karen Reed, someone with no ties to the Canton Police Department, as opposed to the well-known and well-connected Albert family. Why. 
No spoilers for me, but it was getting repetitive real fast. Oh, was it? Family that was never treated as suspects by the investigators in this case. Boston police officer John O'Keefe was found mortally injured on Brian Albert's front lawn. His body was in full view and almost right below Brian Albert's bedroom window on his front lawn. He was found wearing only one sneaker. You'll learn that Brian Albert was a Boston police officer as well, and that he was a trained first responder. Okay. Brian Albert was notified that another police officer was injured and unresponsive on his front lawn, and Brian Albert did nothing. His sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, and other civilians were on his property that morning after John O'Keefe's body was found. Police, EMTs, firefighters, police cruisers, and an ambulance, fire truck, lights flashing, and first responder Brian Albert never came out of his house. Was he hung over, or could it just be like, oh, if it's like, if he's like, you know how like sometimes if you're like sort of like involved, you have to like distance yourself from it and not be a part of it, because then you could be accused of tainting it. Maybe I don't know. Oh, for now. Equally important for you will be the fact that the lead homicide investigators never went inside the Albert home that You'll learn that Brian Albert's brother, Kevin Albert, is a Canton police officer. It was obvious very early on that the Canton police should not be investigating the death of a man found on the property of the brother of a Canton police officer. Okay. So it was decided just about from the start that the Massachusetts State Police should take complete control of this investigation because the Canton police were conflicted out. Okay. Now, that sounded good at the time, but you'll learn that two major problems arose. First, despite the fact that they obviously had a conflict of interest, the evidence will show that the Canton police still had their hands in this investigation. You will find it astounding. But Canton police officer Kevin Albert, the reason for the conflict of interest in the first place, was continually updated about the status of this investigation while it was going on. Second, and equally troubling, is that the lead state, detect state police detective who was assigned to this case was a man named Michael Proctor. Who? Michael Proctor, you will learn, is one of the many people in Canton with deep ties to the Albert family. Michael Proctor's own mother refers to the Alberts as the Proctor's second family. At his own sister's wedding, Michael Proctor was in the wedding party with Colin Albert. And he sat at the head table of that wedding with members of the Albert family. That's the man who was chosen to lead the investigation into the suspicious death on the property of Brian Albert. I mean, what do they do in like small towns, you know, when people are so interconnected with each other? And then it's like, oh, well, the person that's being investigated, geez, my family, they're pretty close to their family. It's like, <laughs> so initially they had Canton police uh, take, Canton police took over the investigation, but then because there's a conflict of interest, they had another uh, police department take over the investigation. But then the lead detective was also close to the Albert family, like, Nahail. That's the man who gave updates to Canton police officer Kevin Albert. While the state police were supposed to be investigating, what had occurred at his brother Brian Albert's house. You'll learn that right from the jump, Michael Proctor predetermined the outcome of this case. Never stepped foot inside the Albert home on January 29th, 20... Wait, so um, let's go back to this family tree. So Brian Albert and Chris Albert, they were both law enforcement? 22. Never checked out whether there were any signs of struggle inside that home. He never called for crime scene technicians and other specialists to look for blood or other trace evidence within the home. He never asked Brian Albert for permission to go in the home and take a look around. Michael Proctor never applied for a search warrant to go in that home. Instead, 
he focused immediately and exclusively on Karen Reed, the outsider. You will learn that no one in the Proctor family has ever called the Reed family their second family. No one in the Proctor family had been in a wedding party with anyone from the Reed family. Karen Reed was a convenient outsider. She was most definitely not from Canton. So how did Michael Proctor feel about her? How did he treat somebody he was investigating at a point in time when he should have been keeping an open mind and focusing on obtaining all possible evidence so that he didn't miss anything? Do we have a Karen Reed interrogation or did she blow up pretty quickly? Well, you will learn that on the very day that John O'Keefe was found dead on Brian Albert's lawn, Michael Proctor was texting with his high school buddies about this supposedly secret investigation using his personal cell phone. He was revealing information about this investigation. Oh, but she did go to NBC and ABC. Ooh. Like, usually when you go um, on, like, TV shows or, like, you do, like, a little segment. I don't know. Sometimes it's, it's not good. Okay, I wonder what she said on there. I haven't watched those yet. ...to his friends. He was revealing information about this investigation to his friends, assuming that nobody would ever find out what he was doing or what he was saying. And he was revealing his true thoughts about Karen Reed. Who oh, was do we have those not going to put in his sanitized police reports. His true feelings. To his friends, whom he trusted, and in text messages that... Interview wasn't good? How so? He never thought would come into the hands of the defense in this case. Lead investigator Trooper Michael Proctor, right from the start, called Karen Reed names you would reserve only for your worst enemies. He told his friends that he hoped that she would kill herself. He told his friends that he had seized her cell phone. And you will learn that he knew he shouldn't have been accessing any content on her cell phone because he knew there would likely be attorney-client communications on between Karen and me at that time. He knew that he was supposed to wait for a search warrant or other... Oh, I was like, wait, did he have a search warrant? Or maybe, okay, maybe he asked for it and then she just, like, gave it to him? ...permission from a judge in order to go through that phone? But you'll learn that he went through the phone anyway, without permission. And you'll know that he did, because he told his high school buddies that he was searching her phone for nude photos of Karen Reed. And he was nice. disappointed he hadn't found any yet. That is the professional and unbiased investigator who was chosen to lead the investigation into the death of John. Is he going to go up there and testify and explain these messages? Oh, no. On O'Keefe. Michael Proctor. We'll learn that one of Michael Proctor's high school friends commented to him that with a dead body on the front lawn, the homeowner in this case is surely going to catch a lot of grief. And you know what Michael Proctor's response to that was? One word. Nope. And he explained why. Michael Proctor assured his buddies that the homeowner would not catch a lot of grief because, quote, the homeowner's a Boston cop, too. And the homeowner's what? Because, quote, the homeowner's a Boston cop, too. Oh, the homeowner's a Boston cop, too? And uh, I got to see the context of this text message. I don't know. You never know. Because it's possible that it's possible that she... It's possible she murdered him, and then it's also possible within that same realm that we just have a very shitty lead investigator. So, I don't know, I need more, more evidence. Okay, give us more evidence. First sentence, ladies and gentlemen, Mike, in Michael Proctor's own words, will explain a lot to you about how this investigation... Also, is Michael Proctor, is he... Where is he at right now? What's going on with him? Someone said that he was being investigated. ...was conducted. You will be able to evaluate whether Trooper Michael Proctor treated Brian Albert and his family differently because Probably. of who they are and their relationships between his family and theirs. Probably. You 
will evaluate whether this investigation was on the up and up. You will decide as a result how valuable or worthless the prosecution's DNA evidence is or is not in light of who controlled that evidence. You will learn that Michael Proctor's fingerprints are figurative. Yeah, I did hear. I did hear that the feds are also involved in this. All over this case, his fingerprints are all over the Commonwealth's evidence. Will- Wait, so was Michael Proctor... Okay, never mind. He wasn't at the house. Okay. <laughs> I was like, it would be funny if we found out later on that he was at the house and he didn't say nothing. Now nah, that would be way too crazy. Michael Proctor showed up at Karen Reed's parents' house in Dighton to interview her during the afternoon of January 29th, only hours after John O'Keefe's body was found dead on Brian Albert's front lawn. You'll learn that Michael Proctor had her Lexus SUV towed from her parents' home. But you'll also learn that he wrote a search warrant in which he falsified the time that he took that SUV. He swore under oath that the vehicle wasn't towed until 5.30 p.m. But you'll learn that we obtained surveillance footage that he didn't know we would get. And that surveillance footage exposed that Michael Proctor's words in that sworn affidavit were a lie. Michael Proctor had that vehicle for about 90 minutes before he claimed to have taken. And folks, you will learn that the timing is important, very important. Okay. Because when John O'Keefe was first found on Brian Albert's front lawn, the police thoroughly searched that uh, yard for potential evidence. And it wasn't just one officer or two or three. There were at least four officers that searched that front lawn. Mm -hmm. And that morning was the beginning of a snowstorm, but there wasn't. Okay, he's getting there. I'm very intrigued. Okay. Get much snow on the ground. Hi, when Stephen. they were searching that long. It was light out by the time they did the search, and it was getting lighter. And during that thorough search of Brian Albert's front lawn, the number of pieces of tail light that were found by a minimum of four officers looking for evidence was zero. It was only later in the day when the snow was really starting to accumulate that the police miraculously started to find pieces of tail light on the property. Well, was it because they were digging through? Because I would understand initially not finding pieces of taillight because let's say if she hit him around like the midnight time, right? And then snow was like piling up. Maybe the taillight pieces were underneath the snow and they had to dig through in order to find it. I, I guess I need to know more about this fucking taillight thing. Hmm. The police only started to find pieces of taillight after Michael Proctor had seized Karen Reed's car. Has seized Karen Reed car. Okay, I'm just trying to see how he would plant this. Okay, okay. They started to find pieces of taillight after Michael Proctor had possession of her taillight. You'll learn that Trooper Michael Proctor then kept going back to the Albert residence after that day, and he claims to have kept finding pieces of taillight on multiple occasions on multiple different days. And in addition, a good week after John O'Keefe's death, Canton Police Chief Kenneth Berkowitz an older officer on the brink of retirement with probably not the best eyesight. Someone, uh, he supposedly was driving, uh, happened to be driving past Brian Albert's house. And uh, by the way, Brian Albert is someone with whom, whom Chief Berkowitz is also good friends. And this older man allegedly spotted yet another piece of taillight from his moving vehicle. This was yet another piece of taillight that was somehow missed by the trained specialists who had previously and thoroughly searched the property. Another piece of taillight that Proctor supposedly missed in the many times he went back to the property. Um, And uh, Michael Proctor claims that he kept finding pieces of taillight right up until February 18th of 2022, which was nearly three weeks after John O'Keefe was found dead on Brian Albert's death. You will learn that there is no competent evidence that Karen Reed's taillight shattered at Brian Albert's property in the early morning hours of January 29th of 2022. To the contrary, you'll learn 
that when Karen left John at Brian Albert's house, she drove back to John's house on Meadows Ave across town in Canton. Okay. At John's home, where he lived with his two adopted children. Karen was drifting in and out of sleep, but she woke up for good in a panic sometime around 4 a.m. because John hadn't come home. And that was not like him at all. He had never done that before. Karen had a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Something was seriously wrong. So she got back into her Lexus and she backed up out of the garage to leave the driveway. And when she did, the right rear taillight of her Lexus. Oh, that's when. Okay. Struck John's parked vehicle in the driveway and her taillight cracked. Now, I wonder, I wish we knew um, if there was like an evolution of the story. Like, was this information already mentioned in the very beginning or was it later on after she lowered up? Hmm. That was the same taillight that the problem. So she backed into his vehicle. Okay. Taillight cracked. Because we have pieces of her taillight at his garage too? That was the same taillight that the prosecution now claims was broken outside the Albert residence hours earlier at 12.38. But we have video evidence that the taillight was actually broken at 5 a.m. Many hours after the prosecution needs that taillight to have been broken. There is, of course, no video of the taillight being broken at Brian Albert's house. You will eventually conclude that that's because the taillight was not broken there. Importantly, you will learn that there was an eyewitness who arrived at 34 Fairview after Karen got there with John O'Keefe in the early morning hours of January 29th. And that eyewitness, Brian Nagel, who's the brother of Julie Nagel, who was at the after hours party that night. He had a clear view of Karen's as eyewitness learned that there was an eyewitness who arrived at 34 Fairview after Karen got there with John O'Keefe in the early morning hours of January 29th. And that eyewitness, Brian Nagel, who's the brother of Julie Nagel, who was at the after hours party that night. Okay. He had a clear view of Karen's SUV. Brian Nagel confirms that there was no damage to her taillight at that time. Karen was sitting in the driver's seat with her hands at 10 and 2. And Ryan Nagel confirms that while Karen was inside the car, John O'Keefe was not. John O'Keefe was also not outside the car at that time. You will ultimately conclude there's only one of them. Wait, where was Brian Nagel when he saw this, though? Outside the car at that time. You will ultimately conclude there's only one of the place he could have been. Now, going back to that 5 a.m. video from John's driveway, you will see Karen back up her Lexus and strike John's car at about 5 a.m. when she was leaving John's house to go out to look for him. And you will know that she struck his car at 5 a.m. because you will watch that video closely. Oh, you no. Oh, wait. Oh, we have a video of this. Well, that makes things a little bit complicated. Karen back up her Lexus and strike John's car at about 5 a.m. when she was leaving John's house to go out to look for him. Okay. And you will know that she struck his car at 5 a.m. because you will watch that video closely. You will witness that the wheels and the hubcaps on John's car are jostled and moved by Karen's SUV. And you will conclude that that video depicts exactly when Karen's taillight was cracked. Mm, but does it line up, though? Does the wheel and the hubcap line up with the back taillights of SUV? long after she dropped off John that night at 34 Fairview. And you will learn that part of the reason that Karen's Lexus hit John's car was that Karen was panicked at that time. Where is John? Okay. Why didn't he come home? It's a good explanation. What happened to him? And you will learn that she was racking her brain for what possibly could have happened. And like many of us, was worried about the worst. Did, did I hit him? Could I have hit him? That was what she was saying, both to herself and to other people later that morning when she went back to 34 Fairview. 
She doesn't react at all when she hits John's car. Of anything else that made sense. She certainly didn't consider in a million years that someone from within the Albert home could have beaten up John and left him to die on the front lawn. Now, that was over two years ago. Now, I guess, like, um, did anyone notice if anyone in the house had any, like, injuries or, like, scratches or, like, knuckles or anything like that? Like, did anyone say, that, like, oh, yeah, I arrived and, like, I noticed, oh, that guy's, like, knuckles were kind of red. Or I noticed, oh, she had a scratch on her face. We have anything like that? Karen didn't know then what you will learn during this trial. Karen <laughs> didn't know that Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. Well, Lisette, le- which way do you think I'm swaying? I don't know. I'm actually really intrigued with this video thing that he's talking about. But it could be that when he shows us the video, it could be nothing like what he's saying. He could be exaggerating. The but I am very intrigued about this video. Was party at Brian Albert's house sometime after Karen pulled away. She didn't know that after Jennifer McCabe dropped off some people elsewhere, she returned to her own home. Karen didn't know that Jennifer McCabe climbed some stairs in her home and eventually made it into her bedroom with her cell phone. Oh, wait, why does that name so familiar? Brian Walsh. Brian Walsh. Oh, Brian Walsh, the guy with the horrible search um, history, right? Accused of murdering his wife. Is that who Brian Walsh is? The name sounds so familiar. Karen didn't know that Jennifer McClickade climbed some stairs in her home and eventually made it into her bedroom with her cell phone. Karen didn't know that Jennifer McCabe settled in at 2.27 in the morning on January 29th of 2022 and typed a Google search that she would later delete. Mm, Okay, hold on, hold on. (laughs) Now we're getting to the crazy stuff. Hold on. (laughs) Let me make sure I got my notes right on this. Someone from within the Albert didn't know then what you will learn during this trial. Karen didn't know that Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, left the after-hours party at Brian Albert's house sometime after Karen pulled away. She didn't know that after Jennifer McCabe dropped off some people elsewhere, she returned to her own home. Karen didn't know that Jennifer McCabe climbed some stairs in her home and eventually made it into her bedroom with her cell phone. Karen didn't know that Jennifer McCabe settled in at 2.27 in the morning on January 29th, 2022, and typed a Google search that she would later delete. 2.27 in the morning was over three hours before John O'Keefe's body was found on Brian Albert's lawn. 2.27 was over three hours before anyone knew or suspected that John O'Keefe was missing or hurt or in trouble. And at 2.27 in the morning, you will learn that with no one watching her, thinking she was alone with her thoughts, not worrying that anyone would know what she was doing. Jennifer McCabe typed in the following Google search. How long to die in the cold? <clears throat> now, she misspelled the first word, so the actual search was how long to die in the cold, but you'll get the point. You will ask yourself, why would somebody Google how long does it take for someone to die in the cold? Unless that person knew someone who either was in that situation or would be in that situation. You will question during this trial, who was it who actually did die in the cold at some point that night? Yeah, it's going to be a battle of the experts on that one because the state is saying, well, that search was done after John O'Keefe's body was found. Defense is saying that search was done before John's body was found. Sometime after Jen McCabe was asking Google for an answer to her question. And you'll learn that the answer to that question was John O'Keefe. The medical examiner in this case will testify that one of the causes of John O'Keefe's death was hypothermia. John O'Keefe died in part because he was left to die in the cold. Now, the Commonwealth will try to dispute the timing of that Google search. They'll try to claim that there were only two Google searches at 6.23 and 6.24 a.m., after John's body was found. 
But one problem for the Commonwealth will be that we have retained Richard Green, one of the leading computer forensic experts in the country. Rick Green has forensically analyzed Jennifer McCabe's phone, both manually and using every appropriate type of computer software to solve this issue. Rick Green will confirm for you that Jennifer McCabe did indeed make that search at 2.27 a.m. And another problem for the Commonwealth is that you will hear and see other evidence that will confirm that Jennifer McCabe is lying when she denies making that Google search at 2.27 a.m. You will conclude that before she went to bed, if she went to bed that night, Jennifer McCabe wanted to know just how long it would take for someone to die in the cold. And a big question in this trial for you will be, when was John O'Keefe left to die in the cold? I expect the Commonwealth will try to persuade you that he was left there sometime around 12.30 a.m. because they're going to try to prove to you that Karen Reed hit him and that his body stayed there the entire night until first responders arrived at 6 a.m. and his body was taken to the hospital. But you will learn that there are big problems with the Commonwealth's theory of this case. You will learn that there were six people at that after-hours party at Brian Albert's house, all of whom left by the front door and would have been confronted by John O'Keefe's lifeless body on that lawn if he was actually there at that time. Those six people walked out the front door to 34 Fairview, walked to their cars either in the driveway or parked in front of the house, Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, was there. I guess, like, how how wasted were the people inside the house? Were they wasted or were they just, like, chilling? How, like, how bad was the snow at the time? Her husband, Matthew McCabe, was Where there. Where was the car park? Like, what was the path that they took from the house to get to their cars, their vehicles, their Ubers, whatever the fuck they was? There. ATF federal agent Brian Higgins was there, who was also Brian Albert's friend. Sarah Levinson, a friend of Brian Albert Jr., was there. Julie Nagel, another friend of Brian Albert Jr., was there. And Caitlin Albert, Brian Albert's daughter, was also there. All of them leaving the residence. Mm. Each of those people left 34 Fairview in Canton, where Brian Albert lived. Each of them walked out facing the front lawn, where the Commonwealth will tell you that a six foot two nearly 220-pound big man in dark clothing was sprawled on the front lawn when there was only a dusting of white snow on the ground. He was supposedly sprawled on that lawn, just feet from where these people were walking when they left the residence. And you will learn that not one of these people saw John O'Keefe Lane. Not one. And you know who else saw no one laying outside in the early morning hours of January 29th? I heard about the snowplow driver. The snowplow driver in charge of plowing the street for the city of Kent. And this is another big problem for the Commonwealth. What time did he come by? You will learn that Michael Proctor, here's that name again, wrote a report where he claimed that the DPW supervisor had told him that Fairview Road had not been plowed that night. Proctor's total investigation on this issue consisted of one phone call and no follow-up. He just submitted his report that simply said the road hadn't been plowed that night, and perhaps thinking that no one else would follow up either. But you'll learn that when it came to finding out the truth, it's not that Proctor couldn't find the truth. It's that he wouldn't. But fortunately, you'll learn that we would, and we did, You'll learn that within weeks after January 29th, we sent our investigator, a former Medford police officer named Paul Mikowski, to the Canton DPW to try to get to the bottom of this. Paul Mikowski talked to the same supervisor at the DPW, a man named Michael Trotta, whom Proctor claimed had told him that the street hadn't been plowed that night. You'll learn that Paul Mikowski found out that Michael Proctor was not telling the truth. You'll learn that Michael Trotta from the DPW told Paul Mikowski, our investigator, that the street was indeed plowed that night and that the name of the plow driver was Brian Loughran. It's 
So Paul Mikowski tracked down Brian Law. He asked Mr. Laughrin if the state police or any investigators had ever spoken to him. And the answer came back, no. You will then learn what Brian Laughrin had to say about what he saw and didn't see that night, and you will be shocked. Brian Laughrin told Paul Mikowski that he was driving a big snowplow in Canton that night. You'll learn that the nickname for it at the DPW was Frankenstein because it had a lot of spare parts and it had been around forever. Brian Laughrin told Paul Mikowski that when he plows the streets of Canton in Frankenstein, he's very careful. He makes sure to check not only the roads in front of him, but also the yards to the side of his plow. He makes sure not to hit a fire hydrant or a tree or an animal or, heaven forbid, a person lying in the snow. He's always on the lookout. You'll learn that Brian Laughlin passed by 34 Fairview in his plow, traveling right by Brian Albert's front lawn at 2.30 in the morning. You'll learn that Brian Laughlin confirms that at about 2.30... Oh, 2.30. I, th I thought he came, like, way later. When he went by that house... John O'Keefe was not on that front lawn. So you'll learn that about two hours after the Commonwealth claims that Karen Reed somehow incapacitated John O'Keefe, an eyewitness confirms that not only could it not have happened, but it didn't happen. But you'll learn that Brian Laughlin also provides some other troubling testimony for the Commonwealth. You'll learn that after making that pass at 2.30 in the morning and seeing no body, he showed up again at the entrance to Fairview Road, intending to make... You'll learn that how could it not have happened, but it didn't happen. But you'll learn that Brian Laughlin also provides some other troubling testimony for the Commonwealth. You'll learn that after making that pass at 2.30 in the morning and seeing no body, he showed up again at the entrance to Fairview Road, intending to make another pass down it with his plow. This time, however, at about 3.30 in the morning, he looked down the street and he saw that parked right next to Brian Albert's front lawn, right in the very area where John O'Keefe's body was later found at 6 a.m., Brian Laughlin saw a Ford Edge parked on the side of the road. You will learn that the police have done zero investigation to, to discover whose Ford Edge that was. You'll learn that members of the Albert... What was the snowplower's, like, plow route? Like, was he just plowing, like... I would imagine you'd be plowing, like, neighborhoods and neighborhoods and neighborhoods. I, I guess, like, how would he remember there was a fort there? Family drove Ford edges. You'll learn that the police to this day claim not to know who was parked right next to the area where John O'Keefe's body was later found. You will learn that while investigators on this case, including Michael Frost... Oh, man, the cameras in the courtrooms are so good completely ignored the snowplow driver who went right by the Albert residence. The defense not only tracked him down and interviewed him, but the plow driver actually took our investigator on a ride back past the residence to explain them. You know, be, um, I, I wonder if the defense has this. I wonder if the defense has like some sort of like a, I feel like this would help a lot to kind of like show the jury how this like could have all went down, like the views. Like, okay, if I was like plowing snow on this road, where would the body be? Would I be able to see it clearly? Like, I don't know. I like it'd be really interesting to see if they ever make like a like some sort of a 3D like rendition of this. That while investigators on this case, including Michael Frock, completely ignored the snowplow driver who went right by the Albert residence. The defense not only tracked him down and interviewed him, but the plow driver actually took our investigator on a ride back past the residence to mm -hmm. explain the precise route that he had taken on mm -hmm. January 29th. Like, if they can show us that, too. You'll learn that some other curious things were going on in the early morning hours of January 29th. Curious things that the police in this case utterly failed to investigate. For example, after people left the after-hours party at Brian Albert's house on January 29th, Brian Albert claimed that he had no contact with anyone but his wife until he was woken up in the morning. But you will learn that he was ultimately confronted by the fact that his phone records 
revealed that he had actually placed a phone call to ATF agent Brian Higgins, his friend, the same friend who had been at his house earlier that night. And that was at 2.22 in the morning. You'll learn that Brian Higgins called him back 17 seconds later, and they connected 22 seconds on their cell phones. You'll be asked to consider just how long 22 seconds is and what could be said and discussed during that long of a phone call. You will consider that phone call in the context of the other curious things that were going on during the early morning hours of January 29th. You will learn about the following in chronological order. 2.12 a.m., Jennifer McCabe arrives at her home. 2.22 a.m., Brian Albert calls Brian Higgins. 2.22 a.m., 17 seconds later, Higgins calls him back. Wait, hold on a second. All right, so we got a lot of phone activity going on. So 2.12, uh, Jennifer McCabe, the one who did the Google search, arrives home. 2.22 a.m., Brian Albert calls Brian Higgins. 2.22 a.m., 17 seconds later, Higgins calls him back. And Brian Albert and Brian Higgins are on the phone together for 22 seconds. 2.23 a.m., Jennifer McCabe climbs the stairs to her bedroom. 2.27 a.m., Jennifer McCabe searches on Google how long to die in the cold. Wait, how did he know that she went up the stairs at 2.23? Oh, it's like a Fitbit or something, or is there surveillance in our house? 2.30 a.m., cloud driver Brian Laughlin confirms. What's, uh, what's Karen Reed's um, profession? What does she do? There was no body on Brian Albert's front lawn. 3.30 a.m., Brian, Al Brian Laughlin confirms that a Ford Edge was parked right where Brian Laughlin Albert's front driver. Oh, is this Ford Edge... Whose car is that going to belong to? In the cold. 2.30 a.m., cloud driver Brian Laughlin confirms there was no body on Brian Albert's front lawn. 3.30 a.m., Brian, Brian Laughlin confirms that a Ford Edge was parked right where Brian, where John O'Keefe's body was later found. The couple will not be able to successfully dispute any of those facts that I expect. Oh, she's a professor, maybe in finance, some finance shit? <laughs> nice answer. Persist in asking me to convict Karen Reed anyway. You will learn that there are other major problems with the Commonwealth theory. You'll learn that when John O'Keefe was found, he did not look like he had been hit by a car. You'll learn that he looked to have been attacked and beaten up. You'll learn that John O'Keefe was a large six foot two man who, if positioned behind a Lexus SUV, would have had his torso completely exposed to the rear of that vehicle, including to the taillight. You'll learn that no part of his torso was injured. There was no bruising, no redges, no scratches, no punctures. You'll learn that his chest and hips and legs were pristine, despite the Commonwealth's contention <coughs> that he was hit by a 6,000 pound vehicle. The evidence will show that what was not pristine was his right arm. You okay. will take one look at that arm and you will conclude that a car did not cause those injuries. The injuries to John O'Keefe's arm appear to be consistent with scratch marks and claw marks, marks that make it look as though an animal had attacked his arm. But you won't have to rely just on your common sense when you look at those photos. You'll hear from an expert forensic pathologist who is world-renowned who has personally conducted thousands of autopsies. And he will testify that those marks are consistent with scratch and claw marks and bite marks from an animal, including a German Shepherd. You'll learn that on January 29th of 2022, Brian Albert's family dog, Chloe, was a German Shepherd. You'll learn that Brian Albert has admitted that this dog... You'll learn that on January 29th of 2022, Brian Albert's family dog, Chloe, was a German Shepherd. You'll learn that Brian Albert has admitted that this dog is not good around strangers. You'll learn that on January 29th of 2022, John O'Keefe would have been a stranger to that dog. 
and you'll learn that Chloe had been the beloved family dog for the Alberts for seven years. The Albert family loved Chloe. But strangely, as we discuss this dog today, the Albert family doesn't have its beloved Chloe anymore. You'll learn that Brian Albert was called to testify before the grand jury regarding this matter in April of 2022, and that he did testify about his German shepherd, Chloe, during that grand jury testimony. Okay. And you'll learn that not long after that testimony, Brian Albert and his family rehomed their beloved family dog. They gave away their family dog. And Chloe, the German Shepherd, is therefore now gone. Now, the Commonwealth will try to take your attention away from all of these troubling facts and try to persuade you not to consider their shocking lack of investigation of anyone else, not to consider John O'Keefe's injuries, not to consider the fact that multiple people left the residence and saw no body, not to consider the fact that the snowplow driver was specifically looking at 2.30 a.m. and there was no body there, not to consider the fact that two people in the house were communicating at 2.22 a.m., but denied speaking to each other for 20 I guess, like, what about the Ford, the Ford Edge that the plow dryer... Blah, blah, blah. What about the Ford Edge? Was it that the Ford... Uh, the plow dryer... The, <laughs> I can't say this. What was it about the Ford Edge that made it memorable for the plow driver? Was it, like, park funny? Was it, like, in a weird spot? Which was like, oh, I like that car. That's a car that I own. Two seconds. And not to consider the fact that one of their... Witnesses who was also the guy just has really good memory. present at the home was unusually curious at 2.27 a.m. about how long it would take for someone to die in the cold. The Commonwealth will instead try to persuade you that Karen Reed supposedly had a motive to kill John O'Keefe because they were not getting along. You'll hear about their trip to Aruba over New Year's Eve and that Karen was upset that John had been flirting with another woman. And you will hear Does she have any history of violence? Karen considered exploring her options after that trip, which led her to a get-together at one point with ATF federal agent Brian Higgins, although that never went anywhere. But you'll also hear that in January of 2022, after the Aruba trip, and not long before January 28th and 29th, John O'Keefe was making long-term plans with Karen. Uh, first witness was the victim's brother. How did that go? Including a family trip with her and the kids, and also another trip with Karen and another couple for months into the future. And you'll see video of how John and Karen were interacting on the night in question. You'll see for yourself how they looked at each other from the video at the waterfall that night. Nobody who saw them that night saw anything wrong. There was nothing wrong. I mean, like any couples, occasionally they would bicker or disagree. But you will hear zero evidence of any domestic violence in that home whatsoever. John never raised a hand in anger toward Karen, and Karen never raised a hand in anger toward John. That simply wasn't who they are. You will conclude the notion that Karen Reed chose the start of a snowstorm to suddenly become violent out of the blue for the first time and intentionally kill her boyfriend by hitting him with her car and leaving him there with a house full of people inside is patently ridiculous. You will also learn that what's not ridiculous is that someone, not Karen Reed, ambushed John O'Brien. Somebody probably didn't mean to kill him, but somebody went too far. You'll learn that Trooper Proctor failed to investigate motives that other people had to harm John O'Keefe. You learn that Proctor failed to investigate anything or anyone who was in the Albert residence that night. You learn that he failed to investigate the antagonistic relationship between members of the Albert family and John O'Keefe. You learn that apparently nobody investigates the Albert family of Canton. Remember, on day one, Trooper Proctor was asked whether the homeowner Brian Albert would catch a lot of grief. And Trooper Proctor himself said, nope, homeowner's a Boston cop too. 
So folks, the trial is now about to start and the witnesses are about to, are about to start testifying. No, this part On right behalf here? of to Albert, to catch a lot of grief. And Trooper Proctor himself said it. Nope. Homeowners of Boston Cop 2. So folks, the trial is now about to start and the witnesses are about to, are about to start testifying. On behalf of Karen Reed, I ask that you do two things during this trial. First, I ask that you pay attention to all of the evidence. The way trials work, the prosecution gets to present its case first. They conduct their direct examinations first. So we respectfully ask that you wait for us. We will get to cross-examine their witnesses. And you will find that cross-examination is the key that unlocks the truth. Wait for us. You'll be glad that you did. Second, I ask that you keep your eye on the ball. You have one job and one job. Mm -hmm. I saw the mom. Job only to do during this trial. And that job, quite frankly, is not to solve this case. Your only job during this trial is to determine whether the Commonwealth, the prosecution, has proven to you each and every element of the crimes they have charged. Beyond a reasonable doubt, to a moral... Uh, who were the witnesses that testified so far? Someone mentioned it was the uh, victim's brother. Maybe, did someone say victim's sister as well? Certainty. The prosecution will fail to prove this case to a moral certainty. They will fail to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. You will reasonably doubt their case because their theory of the case does not make sense. Oh, his brother, sister-in-law, and then officer. You will reasonably doubt their case because Karen Reed was framed, and the evidence shows that, despite the fact that the police never, ever investigated that angle of this case at all. Because the prosecution will not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, they talk a lot about Snow, one of the cops that showed up for the Alberts' home first. They showed his dash cam footage. To a moral certainty, we will stand before you again at the end of this trial and ask that you find Karen Reed not guilty. Uh, not everyone has a ring cam, though. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Giannetti. Or may we approach you at sidebar? Yes. All right. They're approaching sidebar. Um... So this is the brother. I'm guessing the dash cam footage is going to be over. What did the brother testify about? Is that the house? Oh, this is the house, right? Is that the wind? Mm, hold on a second. This is the maybe the back. Yeah, it looks like maybe like the back or the side of the house, wherever, like on top of the garage. Snow. Maybe sister-in-law, detective. Actually, hold on. I kind of want to see what he's talking about here. All right, y'all. What do y'all think so far about this case? What are we thinking? How many of you guys? One in chat if you've been following this case for a while. Two in chat if you're just like, oh, I just, I just got on this case. Three in chat if you're just like, never heard of this case before. <laughs> um, the brother testified of how nice Karen was out to the John and the kids. It was John's brother, Paul, and then Paul's wife, and then a cop today. Okay. Some twos, two twos, some ones in here. One, 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 one before Christmas, one, some twos. Can't wait for the cross-examination. How do you miss a body on that lawn? I think they framed her. Let me say this. Um, the opening statements, while I thought the defenses was definitely way more, the presentation was like easier to listen to and the state was kind of like, okay, there's a lot of people. I'm a little confused where you're at. I think they did both. I think they both did a pretty good job. Um, the presentation, of course, is better with the defense because the defense was a lot way easier to follow along with. But you know what? I'm intrigued by both sides. I'm very intrigued by both sides. And especially when the defense was like, we have video of Karen Reed backing up into John O'Keefe's car. Okay. You can see the hubcap. You can see the wheels on there. 
So I don't know, I'm very intrigued. I can't wait to see all the uh, all the evidence in this. Um, this case has had a lot of publicity. Okay, before the trial happened, a lot of crazy publicity, and then um, definitely, I would say to me, it blew up like in like December. I don't know. We're just hearing about like things left and right. Oh my god, a lot of craziness. Maybe witness intimidation going on. We don't know. Uh, she homeschooled the kids uh, during COVID. You heard a little bit of the case. You heard her talk. You found her to come across sincere, authentic. Backing up into a car is not the same as backing up into a human. In defense has all this evidence. It says it says it does. Then they have a much stronger defense than I thought. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it could be, you know, sometimes when the defense goes up there, they give their story and they're like, yeah, we have this. It shows X, Y, and Z. And then you're like, oh, my God, how do they interpret it as X, Y, and Z? That's not what it shows on the video. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. The courtroom got Wi-Fi just recently. Oh, really? Oh, that's good. Very nice. I feel like their camera quality is pretty good. And then the audio is pretty decent, too. I do wish that they had microphones when the lawyers were talking. But I do see they have microphones for the witnesses. But I don't know. The camera looks pretty good. I'm going to just jump around a little bit. Over uh, to your brother's house. Um, what would be sort of the general points uh, or door that you would use to go inside the house? So um, either the garage door or there's a side, you know, side door right behind that bush. So behind that bush, is there any sort of like uh, walkway or anything like that over there? Yeah, so there's a walkway that leads up to a, a couple of steps and then to the entryway. Is that where the ring doorbell would have been located, uh, labeled as sort of the front door? Yes. And <coughs> the garage area with the driveway that you were referencing in relation to this photograph uh, is not depicted in this photograph, is that fair to say? Correct. Um, so which sort of, with relation to this photograph, understanding that it's not depicted in it, where would that? The driveway would be to the right side of the house as we're viewing it from here. And if I could turn and where about in relation to the house? Oh, what, what okay. Would... Camera system right there. So that would be the driveway, right side of the house, um, two garage doors, the upstairs window, and the ring. Um... Yeah, I saw that they uh, made that last minute change, right? The courtroom to be smaller. I didn't know the reason for it, though. I just thought maybe like have less people in the gallery or something. I wasn't sure. Camera slash floodlight combination. Now, with respect to the garage, uh, was there a particular way that your brother would have, would have kept sort of the garage? area um yeah he had uh, on the left side he had a 1971 ford ltd parked over that side um and he would typically park uh, his car on the right side so the car that you were talking about before that being the chevy traverse is that correct correct and so the floodlight combination with the camera that you see that in this photograph is that correct yes you could just use the laser pointer direct the jury's attention to that right under the window and as far as these particular ring cameras Professor of Criminology at the University of the Internet with the PhD True Story. <laughs> nice. Driveway, garage one, and the front door of the sort of side uh, entryway there. Um, who, if anyone, as far as you knew, uh, had access to those particular cameras? How would they be accessed? Uh, most likely through uh, the, the Ring app on your um, cell phone. And I believe the only ones we had um, access to was my brother and Karen Reed. And as far I'll as your brother... Right. All right, uh, I'll strike that, see if you can lay a foundation. A few times he talked to me through the speaker. You know, if I pulled up to the house and he wasn't home and he would speak to me on it, but I'm not sure if I follow the entire question. No, and that's exactly so. There were points where you would come to the house, correct, and he wasn't there? Yeah. Oh, the mic access to too close to his mouth. And he would sort of talk to you through the, the ring application, is that yeah. fair to say? Yes. Okay. Now, as far as Ms. Reed was, um, when you say um, you believe she had access to it, what, what leads you to believe? Uh, I believe the kids had mentioned it before. Um, Kaylee and Patrick, mostly Patrick. All right, I'm going to strike that. Uh, if you could describe to the jury sort of what part of the house we're looking at here and what the thing in relation to the, the ring that you observed. Here. That is also the driveway from a different view. Um, call it the top of the driveway looking down onto the street. Um, right in this picture here, the ring camera or the floodlight ring is not visible. And the walkway that you were talking about that was behind the bush, do you see that in this photograph? Yes. Okay. If you could direct the jury's attention where that is. Uh, so if you follow that walkway sort of around to the bush, where does that lead you? Right to the um, like breezeway. So for those of you guys who watched this earlier, this is John O'Keefe's house, right? Door. Maybe they're trying to talk about Karen's car backing up into John's car, maybe? I may approach it. Yes. Um, have you seen those on, on like a disc form? Is that correct? I didn't have access. Okay. Now. Hey, Terry. You know, maybe approach? Yes. Discs, uh, one labeled uh, Meadow Ave ring videos. Oh, sorry. So they, they've already been marked. Already been marked. <laughs> All right, so the next, go, go right ahead. Nope. Okay, uh, so. Would please, thank you. 161. Cool. 
uh, my brother's vehicle, and it looks like another SUV behind it. I don't know the two people. If, if you could, just using the laser pointer before, if you could just direct the jury's attention to which vehicle you're talking about when you... So starting with Ms. Reed's vehicle, uh, where, is, where is it in this video that you're with? Um, I believe it's that one right there. And your brother's vehicle? Is back there. And the vehicle you're referring to is, is your vehicle, where is it? And uh, if you know, uh, when about is this video depicting in relation to what you've described as the, the events of January 29th? Um, I mean, that would be um, in the morning coming back from the hospital, mid-morning. They even go on to say there was only a dusting of stone in John's body when they found him. Um, I remember them saying, the state said that when they found John's body, it was like six inches of snow on top of him. But then the defense did say that when the snow plower, when he drove through the neighborhood at 2.30 a.m., if John's body was already out there, there would only be a dusting of snow. That's what I remembered. And as far as the people within this video, do you recognize any of the people within this video? <laughs> the testimony was utterly boring, almost irrelevant. <laughs> I'm like, we have pictures here. Are we going to get somewhere with this? That'd be myself. I believe that behind me is... I guess that radio chick, what are they talking about right here? Be Kerry Roberts, because I believe that's Kerry Roberts' car. She drove uh, my father back from the hospital to the Point Meadows. And Ms. Gilman, if you could uh, just find the video. Oh, that's my mother. <laughs> yeah, this is a video from John's house. I guess, um, how is it relevant here? <laughs> what, are we, uh, what are we looking at? Are we looking at like his body height in comparison to Karen Reed's car? Are we looking at where his car normally parks when Karen Reed may have backed up into it? Or the snow was on the witness stand today as well? They're trying to leave the foundation discredit the rain video of her hitting John's car. I mean, because he did mention Karen Reed has access to the footage, but I mean... I don't see what she can do with the footage, you know, except for delete it. Ms. Gilman, if you could just pause that briefly. Now, with respect to um, this video, do you recognize um, the vehicle that just pulled into the driveway? Um, but that looks like Karen Reed in the, in the photo, in the video. I assume that's her father's car. So this would have been the time that Ms. Reed, the defendant, arrived with uh, her family from the hospital as well? Correct. And uh, Ms. Gilman, if you could just run that through. Next labeled uh, video from Exhibit 6. Gentlemen, if I could ask you to pause there. Now, Mr. O'Keefe, with the last video, the two individuals sort of walking over to the house, you recognize who those were? Yeah, it appeared to be Karen Reed and her father. And uh, the individual who just got out of the same vehicle, do you recognize that person? That appears to be Karen Reed's brother, Nathan. Uh, again, this particular day, January 29th, at your brother's house, that's the first time that you met him. You don't know what their point was, except the blizzard amount of snow. The brother talks about how nice Karen treated the kids, and John would get mad at certain things. Is that correct? Correct. Ms. Gilman, if you could just uh, play this one again. I mean, the judge did mention that he's like laying the foundation right now. So. Now, as far as uh, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that after Ms. Reed arrived at the house, uh, that your nephew Patrick came home as well? Correct. And uh, do you see your nephew Patrick in this video up on the screen now? Yes. So that would depict when he got dropped off, essentially. Correct. Uh, also, did they cut it off or something? Because I don't see the um, the timestamps or anything. <laughs> so you uh, referenced earlier in your testimony, Ms. Reed had gathered some belongings and then had left uh, with all the vehicles that her family came with, correct? Correct. And uh, do you recognize anyone depicted in this uh, video, number 176? That's Karen Reed. And uh, what, if anything, do you observe in this video? Oh, wait, is this, is this after the murders? Or, sorry, murders. Is this after um, the murder? You know, her to have in her hand at this time. Uh, looks like some type of a bag. And uh, Ms. Gilman, if you could just... Uh, Are they trying to say that she was acting kind of sussy afterwards? 
Who's talking right now? Uh, prosecution, direct examination of uh, Paul O'Keefe, the victim's brother. Oh, let me erase my text. Yes. About how driveway, walkway, things of that nature. Shoveling was your. I believe that is me standing there with the shovel. The father of Patrick's friend, but I'm not sure. And <clears throat> with regard to... Um, Returning from the hospital? With regard to that particular day of January 29th, uh, do you recall any law enforcement, whether the PD or state police, coming to the house while you were there that day? Uh, the, not on the 29th, no. <clears throat> During the course of clearing the uh, driveway out uh, as far as snow rides, um, what, if anything, did you observe as far as beyond just sort of snow and ice? Were there any sort of... Okay, so there, this is like the day. They're just trying to show how bad the snow was, the blizzard was. It's crazy. All right, it's a lot of snow out there. And Ms. Gilman, if you could just uh, play this video. But also, um... Where are the timestamps? <laughs> okay, lots and of snow. And last thing, Gilman, if you... Are there dates on there? Meadow Avs, Ring, Video, Driveway. I don't see a date. Mr. O'Keefe, what's up on the, the screen right now? Is that essentially what the driveway looked like at the end of sort of the snow blowing in the shop? Yes. Uh, Ms. Corras, we can have the, the lights back up. All right, I'll probably re-listen to that in like two times speed later on. May I press the way to show? Yes. Thanks, sister's testifying. Yes. Detective Mr. testifies. Mr. Wait, Boston. Boston time zone. Are they East Coast? And Ms. Gilman, if you could just uh, enlarge that a little. Boston. Oh, no, I think Thank Boston's you. the same time zone as, the, like, the screen, Mr. Uh, is that what you Chicago, have right? One? Yes. And, and what are we looking at in this exhibit? So. That's my brother. And more to the left. Okay, okay. so now this is a police department. Further off to the left, is that correct? That's correct. Before we get to that, uh, just briefly, um, Ms. Gilman, if I could have exhibit number 13. Could please enlarge. Thank you. Now, Officer Sharp, do you recognize uh, what's contained in this exhibit number 13? Oh, Boston and Boston is East Coast? Okay. It's, it's a street. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Yes. Uh, we're dispatching arrived on scene. Yes. Absence, uh, the lighting condition, uh, you mentioned it was dark when you arrived, correct? All right, time check. What time is it for everyone right now? That's great. Okay, so this is sometime after when the sun is... Uh, also, if they're going for a murder, should they go for like DWI as well for what, Karen Reed? Oh, correct. Uh, if I could no. ask you to flip to the next exhibit number 14, if I could have that one. Soon. And again, officer, what's up on the screen? Is that what you have before you as exhibit 14? Yes. And you were testifying earlier about sort of footprints in and around where Mr. O'Keefe was. Is that correct? That is correct. And what's depicted on the screen in exhibit number 14, is that fair and accurate portrayal of the footprints that you were talking about? Yes. Oh, my God. I can barely see that. May I approach the witness, Ron? Yes. Oh, this is the house. This is the flagpole. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Cameron. If you could enlarge that just a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, now, from this photograph, well, first and foremost, do you recognize what's depicted up in Exhibit 18 on the screen here? Yes. And this is 34 Fairview Road, correct? That is correct. And in regards to, uh, you had mentioned some sort of landmark up to the left side of the property, facing the property from the street, correct? Yes. And if you could, using that um, laser pointer that I placed up there before you, if you could direct the jury's attention to first those landmarks that you observed. I'm sorry, officer. If you could, while you're oh, sorry, you're just trying to do Oh my God! <laughs> That's there's, there's a flagpole right there. There's a bush. There. Have you never testified on the stand before? Maybe you're just nervous. There and right there, I believe, is the uh, fire hydrant. Fire hydrant, flagpole. Okay. So where, in relation to this photograph, if you can see it here, was Mr. O'Keefe's body when you first arrived? He's right in this area right here. Now, if I could turn back just a moment, when you indicated that you were coming up to the scene and you could see. The three females sort of waving at Mr. O'Keefe on the ground, correct? That is correct. Well, how far away were you from them when you first observed them or first saw them? About 20 feet or so. And when you are driving down Fairview... Do they have a picture of his body um, when it was first discovered? 
probably not right because people probably was like trying to move him around and like see if he's like still alive and stuff like that but do we have a picture uh, if you could describe to the jury where is your direction i also i see there's footprints there but sort of where are you direct as far as you're driving a vehicle no. are you looking straight in front of you or are you looking out the window a no pictures mm -hmm. of all third part. I mean, oh. it could make sense because you know maybe they were trying to um just quickly attend to him and make sure uh, if he was like alive, dead, or something like that. I was looking for the house, the house numbers, trying to find the house where it was, and and there was I saw the the, um, the motor vehicle parked on the side of the road. And that's what leads to my next question, sir. So, what did you see first? Did you see the vehicle parked in front of you, or did you see the people off to the side? Of the I saw the vehicle. May I approach this retrieve number? Yes. Do you want this? A to the scene uh, from the cruiser camera perspective. I start once. Okay. And uh, you're on I would seek to introduce in a minute as the next exhibit. Oh, cruiser camera. Okay. And if you could just pause it right there, Mr. Officer okay. Sarah, what's up on the screen? Uh, is that what you recall as far as the sort of visibility and roadway conditions when you first left the church parking lot? Yes. And uh, this is you sort of leaving from the church parking lot uh, as you're going to 3450, correct? Yes. Now, there are a number I'm of- i take off the captions if that's okay. Different sort of- things up on the screen. Uh, there's an indication as far as the uh, speed that the vehicle is, is going, correct? Yes. And where is that located, if you could, with the, uh, the laser pointer there? Sorry. Whoops, sorry. Now, along sort of the bottom of that uh, particular um, video, there's an indication as far as mic brakes, lights, sign, correct? Correct. If those are activated, is there any sort of change in, in sort of the, the picture there? Does it change sort of color or anything like that that you're aware of? I don't know. And uh, the 683 on the bottom right corner, is that the cruiser that you were in that day? Yes, that's correct. Now, as far as sort of the top middle of this video, uh, there's a date and a time. Is that correct? That's correct. As far as you're aware, that date and time that's up there, that's accurate to, to when this occurred, correct? Yes. Okay. So we're sort of looking in real time, correct? Correct. Uh, so, Ms. Newman, if you could uh, just let it run. Uh, from this. <clears throat> I think that's the house on the right. Is that it? No? Oh shit, all the houses look the same. <laughs> I'm sorry, I stop this so Officer Sarah, this road you're traversing at this point is Washington Street, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And at some point you're gonna then travel through and then take a right on to Fairview, is that correct? Correct. Okay. If you could, just for the jury's sake, as you approach Fairview and as you're taking that right turn, just direct their attention to the fact that that's when you're turning on to Fairview. Sure. Okay. I'm just going you can go ahead and get Oh. So this is already 6 a.m. Snowplower came through at, what, 2.30 and 3.30, right? 2.30 and 3.30. I'm just trying to look at the snow where it's not plowed. Oh! Hmm. 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 <laughs> also remember, um, snow plowers, they have like a height of advantage too. They're like really high up. So this right here is Chapman Street. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean. So this right here is Chapman Street. <clears throat> Because I'm looking at, when I'm looking at the snow, right? I'm looking at the cars and then how many inches of snow goes up to the tire for a lot of these vehicles that were passing. And how much the snow goes up to like a mailbox or something.
This right here is um, Fairview. Okay, we're turning. Uh, so, officer, <clears throat> similar to as the turn on to Fairview, um, at some point, if you observe uh, the point at which you believe you sort of illuminated your spotlight on the side of the cruiser, if you could just uh, speak up and draw the jur jury's attention to that as well. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gilman, if you could continue. Okay. I don't know. It's like sometimes the snow looks like it's like a lot of snow, and sometimes it looks like it's eh. Like here's another car right here, right? And you can see the tires. <laughs> he needs better windshield wipers. Yeah. Right about now, I, I believe I put the spotlight on. Thank you, sir. Sorry, I'm uh, If you could just sort of run it from this point to about uh, the four minute mark or so. And then I'd ask you. Right there. Wait, what? Is that the house? Now, Black pole? Sarah, this is uh, you were testifying earlier as far as the vehicle in front of you that you observed first, and then sort of the parties off to your left as far as the three females waving and Mr. O'Keefe on the ground, correct? That's correct. And if Where? First, and then sort of the parties off to your left as far as the three females waving and Mr. O'Keefe. Parties are on the left, two females are waving. I don't fucking see any of that. On the ground, correct? That's correct. And if you could, just using that laser pointer direct the jury's attention to number one, where the vehicle is that you observed in front of you, and then number two, where you observed uh, the three females and Mr. O'Keefe on the ground. Like so there's the, the vehicle right, right there, and the the females are right there. What? Uh, I can't see. Yeah, the windshield's in the way. Wait, and that's his body on the ground right there, too? Okay, so now, Ms. Gilman, if you uh, wouldn't mind just running this uh, straight through until about seven and a half minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, I see them now. Okay, they're, like, bent over. They're waving. Okay. You could barely, barely see. It's like this, this right here. You could barely see. Um, I could try to zoom it in, but I don't think we're going to really see shit because. Uh, I'll zoom this one in. They're like right there. Like right here. The females are right there. Okay, so now here, I'm going to slow it down. I'll mute it. Did I hit the play button? Is it too slow? <laughs> it might be too slow. Hello? Uh, playback speed 0.5. I don't know. I can't really see much. Yeah, I can't really, I don't know. You, you like kind of, I don't know. I just, I can't really see shit. No Palau camp? No, this is um police officer's car. 
Uh, the guy who's like testifying right now. Is that Karen Reed on the right? Hey Rex, how are you doing today? Miss Rex Murphy, hello. Sure. <clears throat> I have no further questions to this witness, Your Honor. All right. Will there be a cross-exam? Because this may be a good time to stop if there is. There will be a cross-exam. Okay. So, um, jurors, we're going to stop for the day. Uh, I have to caution you those same three cautions. I watched court record on the big screen as a potato quality camera. Um, okay. Why would she go back to the exact spot if she did not know she had done it? She knew. She was mad, very drunk. When she sobered a bit, she realized she'd done messed up. Uh, I would say explanation for that could be like, that's the last place that she left him. That's why she went back to check on him. I don't know. Um, the owner of the house who threw the party never came out to see what's going on. Question mark. I don't know. Did he have an excuse for that? Did he say he was like super drunk? He was wasted. Yeah, what an innocent surprise a uh, curious person would do. I see that evidence too. Guilty wipers. She went back because she was connected with the other two on the screen. The sister-in-law of the homeowner and the sister lives there. Uh, yeah, she dropped him off there. Please do not discuss this case with anyone. Don't do any independent research or investigation into this case. If you happen to see here... Or what I'm curious about is the, I guess, the state opening mentioned that before she went to the, um, the sister's house, what's her name again? Um, Jennifer McCabe. Before she went to Jennifer McCabe's house and then they set out to go find John O'Keefe's body, they said that she made like a weird route taking 30 minutes and it looked like she was on her way towards Fairview, but then she changed her mind. But I feel like she can easily go up there in the stand and just be like, hey, like I was thinking about maybe driving over there, but then I was like, hey, you know what? Let me just pick up Jennifer McCabe and see what's up. I don't know. You guys think she's going to go up there and testify? anything about this case please just her, right? let us know and just to remind you tomorrow will be a half day we'll go from nine o'clock until one o'clock wait tomorrow's a half day why is tomorrow a half day hold on a second you said tomorrow's a half day research or investigation into this case if you happen to see hear or read anything about this case please disregard it and let us know and just to remind you tomorrow will be a half day we'll go from nine o'clock until one morning. She wouldn't go back there. She was trying to get away with hitting him there. But there are so many people who commit murders and they unfortunately go back to the crime scene, right? It does happen. Uh, look at Mr. Koberger, right? Accused of murdering four students. And then they're like, oh, well, he went back there again and he went back there at 9 a.m. What? But I don't know. I wonder what the defense is going to say about that. They're going to say that he never went back there at 9 a.m. Very much. <laughs> All eyes, please. Jerry's close your notebooks and. <laughs> Tuesdays and Thursdays are half days. Why? Is there another case going on? Or does the judge have some sort of like mentorship or conference or what the fuck is going on? Tuesdays and Thursdays are half days. Jesus. If I was on a member of this jury, I'd be like, could we just hurry up and just let's just do it. Let's just let's just rip the bandaid. Um, I wonder what their explanation is for that. All right, guys. Well, that was the opening statement for a Karen Reed trial. I'm going to go back and listen to the um, the witness testimonies, and I'll let you guys know if anything interesting comes out of that. But this trial is slated for maybe six to seven weeks. It's going to be kind of lengthy, and uh, you know, I look forward to I look I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. There's a lot of people that are connected to this. 
um, it gets really confusing because we have a giant family and then we have another giant family and then we have friends and all the people that were there and friends of friends and nieces and nephews who are friends with each other and all that good stuff. I don't know. It's a lot of people that are involved. It's going to be um, hard to keep track of everyone, but I just keep referring to this, just, you know, this initial court TV family tree, <laughs> just to kind of keep track of like who's who, but there's definitely more people um, as well. But I think this is like the general overview of like, we have these people and then we have Karen Reed and then we have John O'Keefe. I think those are like the main people um, that we're just going to be focusing on, but it's going to be a lot of people. And then also, you know, I look forward to the battle of the experts in regards to when exactly did Jennifer McCabe do that Google search when she was Googling, how long does it take for a body to freeze outside or something like that? Shoot, I don't have it up here. Um, what was it again? Like how long does it take to die of hypothermia? Something like that. So the battle of the experts would be really interesting to see. Who's going to be more convincing? He was, uh, he was still stargazing. Oh, he was sun gazing. Ah, I gotcha. Sun gazing. Ah, yes. Totally makes sense. Um, 